phone number because I don't have his phone number. Okay, Hall, you are on live. Dear online community, I would like to welcome you to our online European Congress on Culture and Innovation. My name is Olga Baltag, a European Project Manager for Pol Culture et Patrimoine, and I will be the moderator of today's event. Before we start, I would like to contextualize today's Congress into a wider project that is financed by the Interreg Med program called SMATH, smart atmospheres of social and financial innovation for innovative clustering of creative industries in med area. This project brought together a consortium of eight partners, Veneto Region, Direction of Cultural Heritage, Cultural Activities and Sport, lead partner with Cafosca University of Venice, Autonomous Region Friuli Venezia Giulia from Italy, Barcelona Activa and Institute of Culture of the Municipality of Barcelona from Spain, Technopolis City of Athens from Greece, Agency for Territorial Marketing in Slovenia in Maribor, Zagreb Innovation Center from Croatia, Pol Culture et Patrimoine Cluster from Arles, and TVT Innovation from Toulon, France. As you will see today in our first round table, SMAT's aim is to foster creativity nests in each of the eight territories it, it is developed. Within each nest, the project aims to build a creative atmosphere between artists, culture, and industries, and to bring out collaborative projects between these operators. Nests are places of cross-fertilization aimed at generating added values, human, and material in the artistic, social, cultural, and economic industrial fields. The nest is at the same time the accelerator and the incubator, the curator and the guarantor of the meeting between two complementary worlds which do not know each other well, which do not speak the same language, and which have very distinct functioning. The European Congress is therefore organized by Paul Culture et Patrimoine, the coordinator of NEST Pays d'Arles within SMAT, aiming at tackling issues of culture and innovation at European level and addressing also the current health crisis and how can this situation act as a catalyst for <coughs> innovation in the aforementioned sectors. This event is broadcasted live here on Paul Culture's Patrimoine YouTube channel with the help of Hebu Startup from Nîmes. And today we will be discussing with leading experts from French and European institutions, as well as representatives from public and private sectors of the creative and cultural industries about culture and innovation. And now, before we begin, I would like to ask the director of Paul Culture et Patrimoine, Laetitia Bertrand, to say a few words. Thank you, Olga. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this unique event organized under unprecedented circumstances. Given the health crisis in which we find our, ourselves, I would like to express my regrets of not having been able to host all of you in ours that would have allowed to, you to discover all the beauty and richness of the territory of Arles. Then I would like to thank all the speakers and SMAF partners for the richness of the debate to follow. This Urban Congress is a culmination of the implementation of SMAF project with all of eight partners to come together and reflect upon pressing issues of creativity, innovation, and culture. From the Pole Culture and Patrimoine, Culture and Heritage Cluster, that last two years have been very instructive. As a cluster, our actions were aimed primarily at our member enterprise and institution of the culture and heritage sectors. In the creative industry, each of us puts the definition that suits ourselves, whether that is characteristic of national territory or local realities. 
for all, uh, for the Pole, the creative industry as a sector of culture, raising the heritage as much as the heritage as a service of the cultural content. The projects identified and support at the local event within the framework of SMAF, of SMAF also reflect this local reality. The meeting of ideas carried by individual and or small structure and focused on the sharing of skill and expertise. Thanks to SMAF, our project leader have taken real step in the development and the concretization of the ID, and we hope to be able to continue to accompany them even after the end of SMAF, and especially to create links and collaboration with our European partner and their project leader. The economy of culture and heritage is a powerful reality and on our territory. For example, in all, almost 6% of the active population work on this sector, twice as much as the national level in France. This is why projects like SMAF uh, allow the cluster to further develop its support for supply chains and innovation. And now leave with you with Olga, who is going to present the follow of innovation of this afternoon to you. Thank, Thank you. you, Leticia, for this introduction. So in order to start with our keynote speakers, I would like first to inform our viewers on YouTube that you can address questions to our experts in the comment section, and we will ask some of them during the Q&A at the end of each roundtable. Without further ado, our first keynote speaker is a highly experienced professional in the areas of culture, digital, and media. Camille Demange is a lawyer and the founding partner of the French law boutique firm CDO, dedicated to the sectors of creation and innovation. He was previously Group General Counsel and Public Affairs Director at the powerhouse production company Endemol Shine, after having been the head of the Department of Digital Policy at the French Ministry of Culture and Communication. As part of his activities, he held several ministerial, interministerial and European positions on topics related to the development of the digital economy in the cultural sector. He is lecturer at Sorbonne Law School and also a scientific consultant of SMAT for Pôle Culture et Patrimoine. And now I give the floor to Camille to talk about the economic weight of culture. Thank you, Holga. Thank, thank you so much for your invitation to talk about the economic weight of culture. We, we are often taught that culture is expensive but we really talk about the economic weight of culture. The, the economic weight of culture is a real burning issue and also more so after the coronavirus epidemic. S since the beginning of the year and especially since March, the coronavirus epidemic has affected many sectors of our entire economy. And as you may know, the, the creative economy is being hit hard, not only in economic terms, but also in terms of its identity and uh, social cohesion. Many people have suddenly become aware that culture cannot be reduced to artists only. And, and it's not surprising. For, for, for many, the arts are a matter of enlightenment or entertainment. This leads to the perception that the arts and culture are marginal in terms of economic contribution and should therefore be reduced to um, public sector investment. For example, when we go to a cultural event or a festival, the economy of the city which welcomes this cultural event is affected. Hotels, uh, restaurants, monument entry fee, car parks, uh, technical service providers, cleaning or security companies, etc., etc. We, we don't think about it directly, but, but there are a lot of people and companies involved. It is a real whole ecosystem with existence we sometimes ignore. So you can easily imagine the consequences when such an event is cancelled. For the city of Arles in France, which is well known as a, a dynamic cultural city with international meetings and photography, the, the coronavirus crisis cost the city more than 5 million euros in direct revenues. And the amount of losses is even more uh, considerable if we add the loss that each member of this uh, ecosystem contributes to the cultural enlightenment of, of the city.
I, I use this example because the uh, organizer of this uh, European conference are, are from Al, but it, but it is true for any other cultural event in any city and any uh, European country. Uh, through this uh, very concrete example, we can see how the, the cultural sectors, which is built at its core on uh, artists and uh, creators, can both uh, directly and indirectly affect many activities, not all of which are cultural. In that context, no one can doubt that, that culture is a, a productive sector and play an increasingly important role in national and uh, local uh, economies. However, this awareness has come relatively late. It has only been since the end of the last century when a major traditional industry had either declined or, or disappeared that the cultural sectors and creative industries have been recognized as both a, a heritage and as a leverage for future development. Central and local governments were mandated to develop infrastructure for cultural creation and heritage conservation to, to widen um, the accessibility to cultural goods and services and to ensure that culture bolstered the image of the region. Many uh, European territories have uh, managed to radically transform themselves and diversify their own economic model. And it's at this moment that cultural uh, activities and industry began to both grow, enabling the diversification of national and uh, local economies, generating income and uh, creating employment. The, the contribution uh, of uh, cultural sectors to economic development can be based on uh, three core uh, indicators. Uh, contribution of cultural activities to GDP, the gross domestic product, cultural employment, and household expenditures on culture. Th these key indicators help us to evaluate the vitality of the cultural sectors. Uh, nevertheless, th there, there is a lack of uh, fresh uh, statistical tools available to assess the contribution of the cultural sectors to, to the economy, whether at national, uh, European, or international level, specifically as compared to uh, other industry sectors. That may be due to, to the dual nature of the cultural sectors, both cultural and uh, economic, and to the fact that this dual nature adds value and goes beyond this capacity to create employment, uh, revenues, and uh, incomes. Nonetheless, uh, I have some interesting figures from uh, Eurostat database to share with you. In uh, the EU, the cultural uh, economy accounts for a little more than 4% of the GDP. In Italy, uh, for example, it represents almost 5% uh, of the GDP, and in Slovenia, 6% uh, of the GDP. It, it's really huge. In terms of uh, employment, nearly uh, 7.1 million people in the EU work in the field of culture. This makes the cultural sector the third largest employer in Europe outside the, the public sectors. This place culture uh, right behind the, the construction sectors and the food service industry. And it's uh, also uh, interesting to note that Many jobs come from a flexible and responsive SMEs. And on this point, uh, economists say that the job categories are best placed to uh, resist uh, globalization. Uh, more, moreover, uh, we must remember that the exports of um, creative goods participate significantly in international trade in some uh, European countries, such as uh, Italy, Germany, or France, uh, for instance. Well, uh, all, all these figures uh, shed light on the economic weight of culture. But it's really important uh, to be aware that the contribution of the cultural and creative sectors to the European economy is not limited to its direct impact. Uh, on this point, I would like to talk about two important uh, findings. 
The first one is that there is a positive uh, correlation between the development of cultural activities and the, the social uh, economic development of a territory. And this can be even greater in territories when culture has a very uh, strong partnership with other services such as education, health or, or, or employment. The second finding is that we must not forget that there is a whole section of the cultural sectors that is not understood at all, and yet is just as important. I think, for example, of cultures such as uh, laboratories for experimental innovation, or such as platforms which encourage citizen participation, resources for community building and urban renewal, or repositories for items of cultural and historical values. Products and, and services uh, generated by cultural activities in industries are a vector for a social and cultural development. Therefore, it, it's pretty urgent to consider culture as a, a powerful tool for reviving the, the European economy. Thanks a lot for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Camille, for this very interesting and, and uh, documented uh, intervention. I think uh, for um, a lot of people, we hear the importance of the cultural sector, uh, but um, not uh, all realize how much uh, percentage from the GDP is really the, the cultural sector worth. So uh, giving these numbers was, was really interesting. And uh, I think we can uh, discuss a little bit more and, uh, during the Q&A a little bit later about, uh, about the, um, this, this issue of the economic weight. Thank you very much. And uh, now I would like to present our next keynote speaker who is a representative of the French Ministry of Culture and Communications with a strong background in European studies and a diploma from Sciences Po Paris. Aurélie Champagne started her career in 2012 working in a consultancy in Brussels. She joined in 2015 the French Ministry of Culture and is currently working in the European Affairs Bureau as a policy officer specialized in digital policies and competition law. And her keynote will talk about European policies, mainstreaming culture. Thank you very much, Olga, and uh, good day, everyone. Uh, I will just start by trying to put on my, my PowerPoint. Uh, sorry, can you speak a little bit louder? Yeah, OK, sorry. Yes, thank uh, you. OK, uh, so I was just about to put on my PowerPoint, uh, if everybody can see it. Uh, so, um, sorry, being a, a policy officer that spends most of my days uh, working on legal matters, I have to say that I could not resist the temptation to start my presentation talking about the Maastricht Treaty. And I know it's a bit of a serious approach, but I believe that it is uh, very important for everybody to understand uh, how European policies regarding culture are elaborated. Uh, so, it is thanks to the Maastricht Treaty that uh, the Union acquired a competence with regards to culture, which is uh, to, uh, and I wrote it on the PowerPoint for everybody to read, um, to contribute to the flowering of the cultures of the member states while respecting their national and regional diversity and at the same time bringing the common cultural heritage to the fore. So, what it means, <laughs> what is at stake here? is that culture is first and foremost a competence of the member state that the union can support, coordinate and supplement. So it's very different, for example, from the shared competence that exists with regards to uh, agriculture and fisheries, where the union has the power to um, supersede the action of the member states. So concerning culture, what the treaty means is that there will be no grand common cultural policy. You won't have the same cultural policy in France and in Romania. Uh, it will be different in Germany. Uh, everybody has its own uh, cultural policy and it's very good. Uh, so we will have national and regional policies and some help from the EU concerning uh, common challenges. So to schematize, for the EU to take action in the cultural field, you will need, on the one hand, that the member states are up to it, 
And on the other hand, that uh, a European coordination is necessary to ensure that what we want to do together uh, uh, will be done uh, satisfactorily. So uh, the action of the EU regarding culture, uh, it will be decided at EU level within the EU institution. So I know that most of us uh, are not EU geeks, so I just um, uh, prepared a little uh, reminder of uh, what are the EU institutions uh, so that everybody can be uh, on the same page. Uh, so we have three institutions in Europe. Uh, the European Commission, which is a guardian of the treaty and uh, has the initiative power. So uh, that means concretely that the European Commission is the one to propose legislation. Second, uh, we have the Council. So the Council represents the member states and exercises legislative power with the European Parliament that I will be take, talking about just after. Uh, the Council uh, gathers ministers of uh, every member state and uh, it gathers uh, these ministers uh, depending on the topic uh, that is at stake. So when you have uh, a meeting about culture, it will be in the Education, Youth, Sports and Culture Council. Okay, so the Council uh, takes the proposition that has been made by the European Commission and discusses it. Uh, and then it discusses it with the European Parliament. The European Parliament, I think you know of it because um, most of us vote for the European elections uh, to have a, a, an MEP, uh, a member of the European Parliament elected. Uh, the European Parliament represents the European citizens and it shares legislative power with the Council. So this is uh, the most institutional part of uh, my presentation. I hope it wasn't uh, uh, too boring. Uh, <laughs> and now the question that you all have, I, I believe, is uh, what can the EU do in practice? Because uh, um, these institutions are here to produce something concrete. Um, so I will take a few examples, starting with an example of the EU supporting and supplementing the action of the member states. You must have noticed that movies are increasingly produced through European collaborations. For instance, in 2016, maybe some of you saw the very good movie, to my mind, uh, of Ken Loach, which was I, Daniel Blake. And I, Daniel Blake, was a UK, France, Canada co-production, which won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Festival. Well, uh, that co-production uh, between uh, UK, France and Canada was supported financially uh, by the EU thanks to the uh, media program. The media program is part of the larger Creative Europe program, which is a main line of financing for uh, EU projects uh, with regards to culture. Uh, and uh, this Creative Europe program aims at supporting uh, initiatives in the audiovisual or cultural sector that a member state would not easily accompany on its own. The program can finance projects such as those concerning co-production and distribution of movies throughout Europe, or projects concerning networks active in the cultural field uh, in several member states. Uh, Creative Europe finances our book translations, uh, European capitals of culture, prices regarding architecture and literature, etc., etc., etc. To put up the Creative Europe program. Uh, what happens concretely is that uh, the Council and Parliament receive uh, a proposition from the Commission on how much uh, money are we going to give to culture. And uh, the Council and Parliament discuss and amend this proposition of the European Commission to vote a budget and uh, define the main lines of actions according to which the budget will be spent. We are currently negotiating the EU budget for the next seven years and uh, the parts dedicated to culture through the Creative Europe program uh, should amount, but it's still in debate, to something around uh, 1.8 billion euros. So there is still debate. Some countries are asking for more, uh, like my country is asking for more. <laughs> uh, our French um, minister, Franck Riester, together with his chairman and Italian counterparts, just sent a letter to Commissioner Gabriel, uh, which is uh, the Commissioner for Culture, uh, to ask her uh, to propose a more ambitious budget uh, for culture. 
because you know we 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 we've all been through the the COVID nineteen situation, and the cultural sector has been hit very hard by the COVID nineteen situation. Because, for example, in France, uh, the loss estimated in uh, the cultural field is of twenty two point three billion euros in turnover. So it's huge, and <laughs> and having a little bit more money right now from the EU would be uh, really really helpful. Um, so. Second example, uh, an example where we ask the European Union to coordinate our action. Uh, this is um, something that you may have heard of, uh, which is the European Year of Cultural Heritage that took place in 2018. So uh, it was Germany, uh, which was supported by France, which proposed to the European Commission in a letter that uh, maybe the European Commission could organize a European Year. And uh, the objective was to promote heritage because heritage is considered to be a very central element of uh, cultural diversity and intercultural dialogue. Uh, so we wanted to promote heritage uh, and to do so, we organized, uh, and it's a very big we because it's a, the entire union. Um, we, we <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we organized um, thousands of events uh, where, um, everywhere in Europe. So here, this is an example, the European Year of Cultural Heritage, where a member state is asking to the European Commission to coordinate their action by organizing a label. And the EU was in charge of coordinating the communication and giving the main lines of labelization according to which member states would um, uh, give and grant the label to project applicant. Uh, so I, I just put on the, the logo in different languages for you to remember. Um, it was a very big success. We had almost 13 million people which participated to 23,000 events throughout Europe. So it's kind of huge. And uh, what we have to stress is that it was not merely a one-time thing. Like the European Year of Cultural Heritage didn't really stop in 2018 because many of the events that we organized uh, were perpetrated from one year to another. Uh, for example, some countries decided to replicate events that they had seen in other countries and uh, made it an annual rendezvous. So for example, uh, in France, we uh, used to uh, do on our own uh, uh, event, which was called uh, Rendezvous au Jardin. Uh, rendezvous in the garden and uh, this uh, this particular event in 2018 it became a 16 country event and now it is a 20 country event and it's going to be, get bigger in fact um, plus apart from uh, succeeding in interesting a very broad and diverse public uh, the European Year of Cultural Heritage was a very good political impulse uh, it it allowed us to reinforce the EU action in the cultural field. Um, the European Commission proposed to make some planification uh, for us to, you know, kind of see the culture in the long term. And uh, it suggested a work plan for culture for the years 2019 to 2022, uh, which we adopted. And uh, this work plan specifies priorities for the upcoming years in terms of uh, European cultural action. Uh, it led, for example, to new actions such as uh, actions in the, in the field of music, because for a very long time, uh, we only uh, financed uh, uh, some actions with regard to cinema or with regards to dance, etc. And the music was a bit forgotten of our EU policies. And now we have new initiatives, such as an initiative which is called uh, Music Moves Europe, and which allows uh, for uh, uh, more exchanges in the, in the music uh, field. So for now, uh, you may think from what I've just said that the EU's action with regards to culture is somehow a kind of uh, cherry on top of the cake thing. But there is a bit more to it. Uh, because if you scroll a little bit further in the Maastricht Treaty, you will read that uh, the Union shall take cultural aspects into account in its action under other provisions of the treaties. Okay, so what does it mean? <laughs> well, I think this is a sentence that best illustrates the reason why I chose to entitle my presentation European Policies Mainstreaming Culture. 
what it tells us is that culture is not something that is very detached from other policies. It tells us that many European policies happen to have a cultural dimension. And that is something that you know, of course, because most of you uh, have um, been, uh, you know, gathered through European projects financed by the Interreg Med program. The Interreg Med program, it's not a cultural program, it's a regional policy thing. Uh, because the regional policy has a cultural dimension uh, for you to achieve a social, territorial, economic cohesion between regions. Uh, culture is a very good lever. Uh, but there is not only the regional policy, which has a, a, a cultural dimension. So we are going to chase uh, through some examples, uh, new examples of uh, cultural dimensions hidden in uh, EU policies. And I will start with <laughs> something which may seem uh, counterintuitive, but is very illustrative, um, which is fiscal matters. Fiscal matters, uh, finance, uh, value-added tax is clearly not something which is cultural per se. It is something financial. It is about money. Uh, it is about harmonizing the way uh, countries are entitled to put taxes uh, in their country. And um, well, you have to know that it is the EU that defines whether you can apply uh, a very uh, reduced VAT rate on any goods or services. Like, for example, in France, uh, books are uh, subject to a reduced VAT. Uh, so people can uh, read more because we believe that in order for people to have better access to books, we have to lower the price of the books. So in order to lower it, we put on a reduced VAT. Well, that is something that we had to think about when we negotiated the uh, VAT directive. We had to ask, for a list of goods and services that would be allowed to have a reduced VAT. Okay, so this is the first example. I have a second one, which is, uh, I'm sorry, same uh, PowerPoint page, uh, which is uh, the internal market. The internal market, so the EU has been founded on a principle which is non-discrimination. And the objective of the EU is to have an internal market where goods, services, people, and capital move freely so that we can go on a vacation in uh, uh, some countries that we like. Uh, we have an internal market. To ensure free movement, the EU adopts legislation to harmonize those of the member states. So through an internal market perspective, the EU, through its institutions, adopts legislation that becomes one of the member states. So what can free movement of people, services and goods mean as regards to culture? Well, when you think about culture, you usually think about artists, about uh, painters, uh, filmmakers, actors, musicians, etc. Well, these artists can need something uh, in order to make sure that their works of art circulate. And well, what would that be? What rights would be of interest for artists? Well, maybe some harmonization as regards the way they are paid and the way their art is protected. So here comes the copyright legislation. And uh, it is a, a field in which the EU has set harmonized standards. Um, like for example, uh, when you are not an author, your rights are protected uh, within your lifetime and for 70 years after you're dead. Uh, if you produce a work of art, well, uh, you sell it to someone. And on the day this person would like to resale it, you will have uh, the right to get a portion of the resale price. Okay. And so this is a EU law, which was adopted uh, with a, an internal market perspective to make sure that everything uh, flows in Europe. And it ensures that uh, we have a good level of protection of our artists to foster creativity and investment in creativity. Um, and of course, uh, this is a legislation that needs to keep up with new developments, uh, such as the ones that digitalization entail. Uh, when you think about innovation with regards to culture, of course, you will need uh, uh, to have money to lead your projects. 
but you will also need to have a good legislation that addresses nowadays challenges. So um, about copyright legislation, maybe something that you saw in the newspapers was that we adopted a new copyright directive and uh, what uh, challenges it allows us to, uh, to address is the fact that, for example, uh, we now have a digital environment with platforms such as Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, etc. And for a very long time, these platforms uh, didn't pay much to uh, cultural uh, and to the cultural field. And so we, uh, we pushed uh, during the negotiation of the new copyright directive to make sure that, for example, platforms will pay to publishers, people that uh, publish newspaper, uh, some uh, payment uh, because, well, you know, nowadays advertising revenues are shifting towards platforms. So publishers that uh, pay journalists, that invest in infrastructures to make sure that everybody has a very uh, quality uh, information, well, uh, for a very long time, platforms didn't pay. So we introduced a new right in the new copyright directive to uh, shift the fact that advertising revenue were uh, uh, concentrating on the platforms. Okay, third example, customs. The EU is one unified market with one commercial policy and a unified customs territory. So what a unified custom territory is, <laughs> is that um, a space where you cannot restrict the movement of goods between the member states. You cannot uh, tax imports or exports from one member state to another member state. So what cultural dimension can we find here? Well, there is a particular type of goods that one needs to be cautious about when entering the EU customs territory, and that is cultural goods. A cultural good, it is a, a part of cultural heritage. It can be a painting, it can be a statue, it can be an ancient book, etc., etc. And often, our cultural goods uh, have, you know, major cultural, scientific, historical, uh, artistic, of course, importance. Uh, cultural goods, they carry symbolic value. So why would we need uh, special custom surveillance for cultural goods? Well, I chose to uh, put on a photograph of Palmyr in Iraq, uh, which was destroyed in 2015, closely uh, followed by terrorist attack in, in France and in Europe. Uh, well, Palmyr, what happened in Palmyr in 2015, it was not only a direct attack against archaeological remains. It was also a way to finance terrorism. Cultural goods are frequently looted from archaeological sites uh, to be sold um, in the EU illegally because we have some collectors which are very interested by archaeological remains, even though they were acquired to a war. Um, and uh, this pillaging has now reached uh, a very industrial scale. Uh, it helps finance terrorism. And plus, of course, and it's a very, very sad thing to say, but it, it also leads to the disintegration of local cultures that are deprived from the heritage. Uh, so up until very recently, we had absolutely no common procedure for the import of cultural goods. So anything would enter through any country of the EU and then just you know move on because it's the internal market and you can't stop it and then be sold without having uh, harmonized uh, controls. So we asked for a new customs regulation and the commission proposed a regulation in 2017 that was adopted in 2019. So it took two years for us to adopt this regulation because it's not a very easy subject, customs. <laughs> Take my word for it. And uh, now we have a good licensing system uh, on goods which are known to be most at risk. Uh, we have the power to seize and retain the goods when we are not sure of how they were legally or not legally exported from the original country. And that was all discussed in the customs working groups of the institution. It was not discussed in, uh, in cultural ones. Okay, so is that really uh, all what the treaty says? 
Let's reread it. The union shall take cultural aspects into account in its action under other provi provision of the treaties. Well, I believe that uh, the sentence is uh, kind of uh, a shield. Uh, so the question is why would we need a shield? Uh, because, um, well, if you get back to the start of my presentation, we have seen that the EU may have, depending on the subject, exclusive competence in some areas and may share competence with other member states in other uh, subjects. Well, uh, we know that culture is mostly within the remit of the member states. So the sentence here is talking about also the tension that may exist between different areas of competence. So commercial policy. Commercial policy is a common policy. The treaty foresees that the union contributes to the harmonious development of the world trade. What it means is that we seek, we the EU, for the progressive abolition of restriction on international trade, uh, for the lowering of customs, for uh, the lowering of other barriers. And uh, it is very successful policy because thanks to it, uh, the EU became a major actor in the world economy. Uh, we have only 7% of the world's population, but we account for 15% of global imports and exports. So we are twice as powerful as we are numerous. Um, to abolish restrictions on international trade, uh, the EU negotiates agreements with third countries that facilitate trade and they are to be adopted with a qualified majority, which means that not all member states have to agree for a trade agreement to be adopted. We have foreseen an exception to the rule, to the rule of unanimity, uh, which is, um, which, uh, sorry, to the rule of majority, uh, qualified majority. So we have unanimity when it deals with cultural and audiovisual services. Why? Why should each and every country agree on the opening of trade with regards to culture? Because I mean, you know, you've seen it with the presentation of Camille. Uh, uh, cultural goods are goods to be traded. It has economic dimension. Uh, and sometimes there is very fierce competition between uh, member states. Well, uh, it uh, all goes back to what I've said before about the symbolic value of cultural goods. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's, these goods are, are, are more than just uh, merchandise to be traded. Uh, so we decided to uh, be, take it away from the common rules of competition and trade. And this is something that triggers a lot of debate because when in uh, a few years ago, when the EU started to negotiate the transatlantic partnership with the US, uh, the European Commission proposed to open negotiation with regards to culture. And we were like, oh, no, 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 no. We're not going to put culture in the transatlantic partnership. Uh, and uh, why we were very opposed to it is that we thought it would put member states' culture at risk. Uh, endangering the production of their original uh, works of art. So it will lessen the quality of the works produced by putting much more focus on their economic dimension rather than on their artistic one. So uh, to conclude, um, policies are political. Uh, to design them uh, is about maintaining the righteous balance of powers between the EU institutions and the member states, especially concerning culture, which has a very transverse nature. So it requires from every policymaker, be it a ministry, as the European Commission, as someone in the EP, someone in the Council, vigilance to think whether the action may have an impact on the cultural field. So negotiating a budget for the EU means, of course, having money for culture, uh, in the line of the Creative Europe program, but it means also having dedicated parts in uh, research or students' mobility uh, budgets. Uh, it is about remembering that when uh, negotiating a regulation on the protection of personal data, you wouldn't want to destroy archives, which are going to be tomorrow's history. Uh, so yes, uh, um, maintaining the right balance of powers and main mainstreaming culture is a common effort and an effort of uh, every day. Uh, thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Aurélie, for this very comprehensive and uh, extensive uh, presentation of the um, of the competences of different uh, EU bodies. I think uh, you covered a lot of topics that uh, that uh, are going to have a small uh, rebound from from the um, from the speaker uh, in this afternoon uh, from the speaker from the European Commission. Um, I especially wanted to highlight the. Um, the the tensions that you mentioned between different areas different territories uh at at regional level but also at national level because um you, in your presentation you talked about the exception exception culturel so the the french exception of uh, how they treat culture and this is a, a reality that is not um, present for for all territories in european union and this this is one of the challenges that uh, uh, we as uh, as uh, partners in European projects have to face is how do we treat and how do we we tackle uh, the different realities of our territories and uh, from the national uh, state and also from from the from the local uh, public institutions. So thank you very much for for this uh, for this um, presentation. Um, before we continue, I wanted to remind our viewers who connected later that this European Congress is organized by Paul Culture et Patrimoine within the framework, uh, framework of SMART project financed by the Interreg Med program. And next on our agenda um, is the roundtable of how we can create opportunities to develop in European territories smart atmosphere of social and financial innovation for innovative clustering of creative industries. So we are welcoming here a discussion about SMART's uh, model, our, uh, our project's model uh, and achievements uh, with uh, Professor Fabrizio Panotto from Kafoskari University. Uh, and as a practical witnesses, we'll have Antoni Sikonomou from Innovathens from the Greek Creative Nest, Guifre Beloso from Barcelona Activa, uh, Vladimir Rudel from uh, Maribor Development Agency, uh, Leticia Amio from TVT Innovation, and I would uh, like to invite Professor Panotto to start with his presentation to talk about SMATS model. Hello, everyone. Uh, hope you can hear me. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to share today. Uh, Holga, can you confirm that I have uh, seven minutes? Yes, you do. Seven minutes, fine. So I start my timer, okay. Good, you, you stop me whenever, if I, if I can't manage to stay in. Hello everyone, I will, I will offer a, a short introduction to our project, SMATH. We, we started a couple of years ago with, with some ideas and we tried to implement it. So I, I will rush into, into where we started from. Uh, we, we started on what we knew about cultural and creative industries, and we tried to engage also with what we knew. And as you, we all know, being, being in the field, there is a narrative going on in Europe since, since 1997 about cultural and creative industries, which has been invented uh, in, in that years, uh, in, those, in, in that year in, in the UK. Uh, that narrative tells us that culture and creativity can be industries, so uh, it's, it's a new thing, they can be industries, and they can supplement and replace uh, the old industries uh, in a way. So because of the industrialization, we have CCIs, they can attract talents, they can generate economic value, and they can also have spillover effects on the rest of the economy. This is, this is where we started from, this is the story that we had in mind, that we still have in mind, that European policies have in mind, at least at the time. Uh, and we knew that uh, when, when you design a project, you have, uh, up until that moment, a certain number of activities that were mainstream in order to support uh, culture and creativity, provision of physical spaces, provision of digital platform, uh, direct financial resources for starting up of entrepreneurial activities, and then lots and lots of meetings and workshop and training, which is all good. But in designing the project, we also brought in some research that in the meantime had been done. So we, we, we brought in 
the triple or quadruple helix of, of European politics and looked also at research um, evidences. And, and, and this led us to think that maybe when it comes to promoting uh, creative and cultural enterprises, maybe there's something that was missing. Maybe there was a gap that we could fill. Uh, and we started to reflect based on evidence that maybe culture and creativity are not precisely the same thing. We put them together, but they are different. There are fundamental differences. There are, as we've just heard, exceptions of culture. Culture is exceptional because exceptional also in the relationship with, with creativity. And what is this exceptionality? What is this distinctiveness? Uh, we found it in the core of the cultural activities. In the core, we find art. We find the purest expression of artistic uh, urgencies of artists. And so we thought that we could reimagine the relationship between art and the creative industry, the place of culture within this aggregate, within this aggregation of culture and creativity, and also with the rest of society. And we thought, and this is why smart comes in, we thought that the idea of smart atmosphere could be a way of re rethinking and reproposing a new relationship within what we have been used to call the CCIs. So what is a smart atmosphere? Smart atmosphere is at the core of our SMATH project. We want to build intense exchange of information between artists and businesses. Well, we want to look at the core. We want to look at what is distant. And what is distant is the core of the cultural activities and the margins which are represented by other forms of economic activities. And we want to stimulate combinations and collaborations between the two. We want the arts to be more involved in business opportunities. We want the arts to have business opportunities and to be more involved in business processes. How do we do that? How do you make a creative atmosphere? And here we came up with a new notion. We know we have many notions and we came up with the idea of the nest. The nest is, is this, uh, is, is this uh, welcoming small place. It's a place that can be constructed and deconstructed according to needs. It's a place in which you grow. You grow as a strong being. It's not an incubator where you go when you are sick. Uh, it's a place in which you are healthy. It's just you are little. You are little and you need to be, you need to be supported, but you're not sick. So it's just, you know, we, we do not incubate you. Uh, and what, what we provide in, in a nest is care, is care and human interaction in order to stimulate and activate the relationship between the cultural core and the business domain. So of, of fundamental importance in the idea of the nest is the human dimension. A nest is, is not necessarily a new office. A nest is not necessarily a new sequence of complex activities. It's not bureaucratic. A nest can be a person uh, or a group of persons in uh, an organization devoting their activity to intense uh, human uh, caring relationships between um, the world of the arts and the world of business. Yeah, so it's easy to set up a nest bureaucratically, organizationally. It is complex because it mobilizes very specific human and professional uh, um, skills. A brief example of the Veneto region. Of course, we've replicated this uh, in, in all the countries and the regions involved and by all the partners. We, in the Veneto region, to give an idea, we started off with 40 preliminary ideas of art and business collaboration. So pretty large numbers of artists and, and firms coming together. Uh, we, we try to refine these initial ideas by workshops and trainings to identify less but more sustainable collaborative projects. And then, and then we started with this, which we think is the crucial um, service provided by, by SMART. We started this professional intense coaching with, with experts and experts here, they are experts, not because they, they possess some, some esoteric knowledge, but because they have a mixed knowledge. They have a mixed knowledge between the artistic, the curatorial aspect, the art history even, but at the same time, they can also look and understand uh, business issues and, and, and problematics that form in the business environment. So 
Each collaboration, just to give a few numbers, in our case, absorbed at least 50 hours of individual personalized assistance to each of the collaborations. So it was, and still is, because we are in the process of completing it, a rather intense process. Very quickly, a few examples uh, of the 13 uh, couples we put together. We have been ranging from large firms to small firms, manufacturing service firms, and different type of projects uh, ranging from communication to social cohesion to um, environmental also protection and, and urban regeneration. So we have the 13, maybe we'll leave the slides so everybody can have a look uh later on at at what we are uh we've been doing finally my final slide is on what we have learned uh and what may be also future activities and actions by the eu could could uh, pick from our experiences uh what we have learned is that proximity is not enough uh you you don't produce clusters just by placing people and organizations together I think, I think, this is personal uh, from, from an academic point of view, I think that we've insisted a lot in European policies later in this idea of clustering as a physical activity by bringing firms, CCIs in the same place. People do not get together because you place them together. Clustering is a social and cultural activity. You have to do something. You have to be in the middle, generating relationship in order to cluster. Only if those social and cultural ties are developed, then you move to the physical bit, not the reverse. CCIs are history. We often forget that CCIs have been in place in Europe for centuries. They've always been there and they've always provided creative services to traditional firms. Uh, Toulouse-Lautrec was, was producing illustration and affiche for products in France in the late 19th century. And the same was true with many other creatives across the 19th and the 20th century. Um, a school like the Bauhaus was precisely set up to provide the creative services to traditional firms. So when we say that we need to develop the relationship between creativity and traditional organization, we discover hot water because it has always been there. And this is something that we have to remember. What we have to focus is in, on what never happened or happened less in the history of the collaboration between culture and creativity and business. We need to reflect on the notion of industry. Again, we go back to the notion of the exception. If culture is an exception, then maybe it doesn't really fit into the notion of industry. Uh, and maybe we should talk, if it is exceptional, we should attribute to it another, another name or another category. And we should place greater care greater attention and possibly more resources to how processes actually unfold to really unleash innovation that is truly disruptive. We need, I think, to place more attention to processes, meaning that we, we need to also train people to be active in this collaboration and to generate and to gap and to bridge the distance between the different words, but it's only by, by bridging the distance between the core of the arts, the exceptional core of the arts, and the standardized industrial business world of the firm that we will generate something truly disruptive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Fabrizio. Um, I think we will have some, some uh, some of the elements to discuss during the, the Q&A uh, a little bit after the, the, everybody's presentation. Now I would like to uh, invite uh, Vladimir Rudl from Maribor Development Agency to present SMAF's achievements and challenges for Slovenia. Hello from Maribor, hello from Slovenia. Uh, my presentation will be maybe a little bit different uh, like from the others as uh, we are in the situation that we are not the project partner. The Maribor Development Agency actually is the associated partner to the agency of ter uh, territorial marketing. And yeah, 
we decided to have somehow an active role in the project, not just observing what is going on, but also to add something to the project and to take care that there will be certain changes in the region in the, in the near future. So maybe just a few words about who we are actually. We are a public institution, non-profit institutions, uh, and we are responsible for the coordination of the regional development activities. And yeah, we are quite experienced in the development of clusters and networks, implementation, animation of investors, and of course, what is very important, supporting young entrepreneurs and startups. This is one of the quite important activities we are involved for past 10, 15 years. Uh, yeah, we are also one of the uh, one of shop points for the SMEs in the region and uh, what is maybe the role I have in the agency is I'm the head of the Enterprise Europe Network office here. So my help and assistance to the project and to the companies that have been involved is mainly in uh, preparing their business plan and preparing uh, or helping them in the interestization activities. Uh, yeah, this is a very short presentation of who we are and I would maybe go to the to the region and the, um, the sector in the Podrawia, actually, uh, we are quite different. It means in the sense of the size of the region itself. So it is like the situation we would have maybe 10% of, of territory of our colleagues in Barcelona or in, in Venice, for example. It means uh, this also requires quite different approach in offering the assistant to, assistance to the to the project we have gathered in the in the region and yeah it's also quite different situation with the with the SMEs we have it here because they cannot survive alone so simply in the local local area it means they have to go on the national territory or they have to go mostly transnational so um, a little bit different approach we have been planning from the very beginning and it was also quite evident that the companies uh, and the, the creative industry sector and the culture sector that joined the project is, was actually very open and was searching for the contacts abroad. Uh, yeah, we have been also using a little bit of the, of the experience of Maribor being European capital of culture in 2012. And uh, at the moment, I would say we are also making some know-how transfer to our colleagues from other cities, uh, cities especially from Tui, which is a candidate for the, for the European Capital of Culture in the near future. So it's very, very interesting approach we have in transferring the know-how from the project itself. Um, yeah, what we, the situation we have here in the region is that we have quite many people working in culture and it is statistically seen very many of them uh, being financed by the, by the national budget, bigger, medium-sized institutions from this area. And we have quite high number of also freelancers and micro businesses who move between commercial and non-commercial context. So if we say that an average size of the sling company is four, four three uh, employees, it is very typical for, for the smartness here in the region, in the city, that we have very young entrepreneurs, also quite young companies that have joined the, the nest itself. And uh, yeah, mostly it's really uh, less than 10 people employed. It means really micro companies or people being self-employed. Uh, yeah, I can also say that we had brought in the project also some experience uh, before starting the project itself, because the service development started uh, already four or five years ago in the agency in our, on our side. We have been working quite a lot with uh, young and future entrepreneurs which many of them came from the CCI sector. And uh, we had developed a model here where these people were actually uh, actively working with us. They have been somehow employed by us for the time period of, of three to four months. We did the aim 
that uh, we help them develop their project idea in the good business plan uh, to help them to assist them in in making good presentation to the potential investor and uh, fitting them a little bit also on on the market so starting marketing activities in this in this period but of course it is not so easy from our experience because um, yes yeah, some of them are really in the position to be very quick in this process and i would say majority or more than 50 percent of them it's not in the position that you can push them that in three or four months they could prepare a perfect business plan and start with activity so this is some experience that we brought in the project and meanwhile when we have now 24 projects in in the in the region we see that our experience now is that um yeah the whole process takes a little bit longer so we have been somehow calculating uh, that it is nearly six to twelve months time we are now investing in working with the with the projects we have selected and um, yeah, it, it is also very different uh, uh, time consumption to offering uh, consultancy services or coaching to them so while it was mentioned by professor Pornoza about 50 hours per company we have very different situation it's maybe starting from from 30 40 hours and then going up and and up so it can be also much more if it takes about one uh, one year time. What is also very important in the region or experience is that um, we were at the, from the very beginning looking for, for synergies in cooperation with our stakeholders. This was very important uh, when we started at the very beginning also cooperation with the city of Maribor because the city uh, itself, uh, they have been very actively involved in different activities in in the CCI sector till now, but typically the, the public sector, it's not usually involved in delivering marketing services and assistance to the SMEs. So they were very open for the cooperation, especially while they had already some mapping provided in the city itself, and they were very open to offer uh, the assistance in delivering additional than very pragmatic services that would lead to a realization uh, implementation of different projects so they needed somehow someone who could help them as a management unit uh, from outside in in showing the results the successes so we somehow also agreed in the region that uh, we will start very actively to work with the SME supported institutions starting from the chambers to the technology park and uh, business incubator and also with the with the, the spot, it means SME so one-stop shop uh, network in the region. So here we're a little bit lucky because we are coordinating this regional network and uh, it's a good opportunity to get information who is asking for these services and also to inform the whole potential region about these services. And uh, what we also did, we didn't concentrate uh, just on the on the region itself or the city itself. In our case, um, we changed a little bit the approach from the very beginning, and we agreed with the Agency for Territorial Marketing that uh, as one of the first regions in Slovenia, uh, regional development agencies, we could also cooperate quite well with other Slovenian regions. So for this reason, we have also planned additional information days and workshop with the SMEs and we had a very good exchange of information. So it means other regions have been involved in similar projects and why not to use this to make a know-how transfer from other projects to ours and also vice versa to know, know how we are developing now to other regions. So this is something it, what was very important uh, for us. Yeah, and then uh, what is very important, yes, um, we will really like to improve the cooperation in the near future. And yeah, here it is our experience that it's not so easy job. There are intercultural differences in the different sectors. It means it is already very hard 
to bring someone from the cultural sector to work effectively with the industry itself, or maybe even creative uh, industry sector. So the habits are different, expectations, the values are completely different, and it needs some kind of training we are providing to one and to the other sector so that they understand each other, what the other side is expecting, and in this way that they can also deliver the services uh, in this way that they come to the success in the negotiations. Um, yeah, we have defined, of course, some priorities in the region. Uh, and in, it, was in, it is in the sense that uh, um, it should be um, sustainability provided. It means not what will happen till end of this year uh, when the project duration is still available, but what will happen in the near future. It means we somehow agreed that there will be training activities, access to finance, consultants in this area, and networking provided as well as internalization services. This is some of the topics we intend to provide as a nest in, in Maribor also for the, for the near, uh, the near uh, future. Um, yeah, for the end, I would maybe conclude the speech with the sense that um, the situation changed quite a lot. From the very beginning till February this year, it was one very clear vision of what we'd like to do, but with the, with the pandemic situation, the situation uh, itself changed quite a lot. It means, yeah, we said in February, now this will change the situation for, for the next three, maybe four months, but from the summer time on, we will continue working as it was before. But as we see it now, it's not so easy. So we have still one challenge here in the project and in our nest, how to adapt our activities uh, in the near future. It means what can we do in the remaining six months uh, to adapt uh, the situation to the, let's say, post COVID uh, era that will be happening in the near future. So this is one of the main challenges that is maybe still open and we are now really trying to solve in the near future. This is maybe for the introduction from, from our side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vladimir. I, I already have a question uh, for you, but uh, we will wait for everybody to, to finish their presentations. Um, now I would like to invite uh, Antoni Sikonomou from Innova Athens, the Innovation Business Accelerator of the City of Athens to share his findings and to have the feedback from, from the Greek Nest. Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me and participating in this roundtable. Uh, before starting my presentation, uh, is it okay? It is already, can it already yes. be? Yes, yes, it's okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I would like to make a small introduction. I'm very happy to be uh, in the third place after Fabrizio and Vladimir. And uh, I would say, uh, concerning these first two presentations, that we can keep in mind two keywords. The keyword exception from Fabrizio's presentation and the keyword difference from Vladimir's presentation. Thank you, Fabrizio, for your exceptional good presentation of, uh, about why we, can, we must not regard culture as a, an exception. And thank you, Vladimir, for your differentiation issues you uh, mentioned. Uh, is it okay? Yes? Okay. So uh, let's speak about our uh, Creative Industry Accelerator Volume 4 in Technopolis, City of Athens. And uh, let's start from a presentation, a short presentation of Technopolis, uh, not uh, to repeat uh, things, but to remind you perhaps, or to point uh, out that Technopolis, City of Athens can be seen, not as, uh, necessarily in the sense 
uh, Fabrizio uh, mentioned and analyzed as a nest, a big nest, because in Technopolis, uh, a, a lot of uh, cultural interaction are uh, uh, since years already been uh, taking place uh, take take place in the in uh, the last 20 years technopolis city of athens is uh, located in the old gas works of athens a rare industrial monument which has been transformed in 1999 into one of the most vibrant multicultural spaces of athens hosting today more than 1 million visitors per year it is based on three pillars, the multicultural venue that is organizing events, cultural events, meetings, networking uh, activities, and musical concerts. The Industrial Gas Museum that uh, is exhibiting the history of this site, how things are uh, going from the middle of the 19th century till the middle of the 80s of the previous century. And in Athens, the hub of innovation and entrepreneurship that I'm uh, uh, representing here. Technopolis promotes arts, cultural development, and several things. And we are attempting to enhance the development of different communities and contribute to the improvement of the citizens' quality of life in any possible way. That's the sense I want to uh, applique, applique, uh, to, to, to use in order to characterize Technopolis as a nest. Trying to implement our vision in order to connect in a harmonically and uh, innovative way the historical past of this site, the cultural present of this city, and the technological future of the so-called uh, innovative ecosystem. Technopolis takes part in several international European and European activities that could extend its appeal outside Greece. This math project in this case was representing for us an excellent cooperative environment that could help us to boost our goals and strengthen our international internationalization strategy in the field of the so-called CCIs. It gave to our beneficiaries the opportunity to know and be connected with similar attempts, ideas, and plans that are being developed in countries and cities represented in this project. In Athens, especially, that has been established in 2014, uh, make, three, make three things. It organizes and host information and networking events concerning innovation activities in this city and the, its innovation ecosystem. It implements workshops for the development of technical, digital, and soft skills. And mainly, it, uh, it runs periodically and without any participation fees, a three-month program which supports creative people with innovative ideas, startups, and existing companies we are specialized consultants, experienced entrepreneurs, and recognized academics offering identification of business needs, seminars, and personalized mentoring and coaching. We have run eight cycles of acceleration in our uh, life, short life. And the table here is, attending to, is uh, attempting to capture the main data of this acceleration uh, cycles. Uh, we have uh, host uh, uh, more than 130 uh, teams here, more than 280 beneficiaries, individuals. And uh, the orange uh, uh, numbers are concerning CCIs because the four of these eight acceleration cycles were focusing in the field of the culture and creative sectors. So uh, I, the numbers are uh, big and small in the same time, uh, but I, I think that the two last columns are giving us a satisfactory icon, a picture 
of uh, our uh, development uh, and, and, uh, and our activities. So in the next page, you can see the topics in which our acceleration uh, has been uh, focused in the past eight cycles. The orange are also uh, are, uh, again signed, signing the uh, topics of uh, the teams that uh, have taken part, part, part in the last acceleration uh, cycle that was uh, uh, integrated in this math project. So we have had uh, two applications and uh, ideas about design. One about uh, an application about uh, uh, on uh, about a museum uh, uh, exhibition and uh, uh, a new technology from uh, museum uh, uh, visiting vis visiting mu museum visiting yes. Two uh, uh, of our applications have to do with uh, had to do with inclusive culture. Let's say that uh, means. The, these uh, applications had to, to do with uh, disabled people of uh, two kinds, uh, mobile uh, disabled, mo the disabled in, in the mobility uh, uh, sense, and one uh, had to do with people that are in the so-called phasm of autism. Uh, four of uh, our applications had to do with the uh, combination of art and education, and four, and four with uh, uh, tourism and culture. Here, some uh, pictures of our uh, uh, teams before COVID uh, in the physical uh, layer, <laughs> let's say. And uh, may I close my pre small presentation with my main conclusions concerning uh, SMATH. Summarizing the benefits from the participation of, of Technopolis in cooperation with its very experienced associated partner, Kino Company, in the SMATH community and project, we'd like to underline the following points. First of all, that the selected applications, ideas, and projects that have been supported in the acceleration program of ours included a series, a series of more compound, compound applications in comparison to the previous cycles, especially the application concerning tourism and inclusivity. Second, that the interest of investors and uh, cultural organizations was a remarkable high because first of the good level of uh, the ideas and projects, and uh, second, that thanks to the philosophy of SMART in building nests and atmospheres before beginning supporting the teams. Third, concerning the goal of inclusivity, the two teams, and it is very interesting already, participated in the smart accelerator of ours are already implementing part of their projects in a close collaboration with and for Technopolis. And uh, fourth, but not least, COVID-19 had unfortunately minimized the benefits that could be gained in the framework of the transnational collaboration meeting scheduled to be held there in Arles. Although the digital meeting we had was a very satisfactory substitution. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Antonis, for your uh, presentation. Um, it is very curious uh, the way you started uh, to talk about the fact that uh, Technopolis acted as a nest before it was created and called a nest within SMAP. So that is an interesting point of view. Um, I would like to invite now uh, Leticia Amio to share the information about uh, Toulon Var metropolitan area in France and how SMATH was developed there. And uh, uh, especially since uh, their nest was uh, mainly focused on uh, visual arts. And I think uh, she will have a, 
uh, a little bit a different point of view uh, than the, the institutions that were presented uh, previously. So Leticia, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Olga. And um, I just wanted to say hi to everyone. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen if everything goes well. So you're going to be able to see the presentation I wanted to have today. Okay, it's coming. Okay. Olga, do you see it? Yes, yeah. thank you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Um, well, so hi everyone. I'm Leticia Amio. I um, I work for TVT Innovation, which is the new uh, economic development agency of Toulon, Provence, Mediterranean, and which is also a business innovation center located in the south of France, next to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, in the city of Toulon. We were uh, partners and we are still partners inside the SMATH European project. And we locally work uh, with uh, the cultural incubator of our city, which is called Le Port des Créateurs. Uh, what I wanted to illustrate today during this MED Congress is how the SMATH project enabled us uh, to work on our um, resilient territory, which is the Toulon Provence Mediterranean area, by testing uh, a way to bind uh, innovation, creativity, culture, and art. And I think it was for us very interesting um, to be able to try something new uh, with the methodology that Fabrizio presented and with the creativeness. Here, what kind of, um, of uh, territory are we talking about? Who are we and uh, what type of resilient territory is Toulon? You can see in the picture on the bottom right that Toulon uh, comes from, uh, from a long history and sometimes difficult history. Uh, especially in the city uh, heart center. We are the first military port in France. Uh, we were very impacted, of course, by the war and especially impacted also when the military and the shipyard activity uh, cut back. Uh, so in the 80s, 90s, it was uh, pretty hard uh, for the city and it was very hard also because um, you had a lot of unemployment, uh, very uh, degraded urban uh, development. Um, so we really needed um, some new policies uh, to be able to create urban resilience and to empower uh, the people with the fact that the city centers was there and that there was something to do about it. So we, especially us, as the new uh, development agency of Toulon, uh, we really wanted to focus on creative resilience and see how it could work inside uh, and, and within uh, an economic development strategy. As you can see, it, things are happening now in Toulon. We have a brand new creative district that just opened uh, right before the COVID crisis. We also have a new uh, art street. Um, we have uh, our partner uh, in this project, also Le Port des Créateurs, the business incubator, uh, the cultural incubator, sorry, that opened uh, two years ago. So, and a brand new festival dedicated to cultural and creative industries. So we can see things are moving in Toulon and uh, we wanted to work uh, to be able uh, to create something in partnership uh, with, uh, with the local stakeholders. And um, it was a good way for us to tackle the challenges to work with the creative and cultural industries for our territorial development. Because of course we consider uh, it's important uh, to have strong cultural identity at a local um, 
in, inside the local um, development uh, uh, inside our city. It, we, it's important because it's high value content and it's important for job creation. Well, they won't easily go abroad. They're going to stay here. It is a catalyzer for change and for innovation. And like it was presented in the first, uh, in the different uh, presentation, it is something that can enhance social uh, cohesion and that can participate to a form of resilience uh, for those territory which are having uh, difficulties. Of course, we all know the difficulties linked to the CCI and to the way the society today are the economic stakeholders see CCIs. Often they lack economic acknowledgement. Uh, the investment readiness of the entrepreneurs or the artists who have their projects is hard to get. Uh, financial sustainability of ideas and projects also is something we need to work on. The fact of getting you know, across borders uh, to get people to know what you do, your artwork, and get it in a more European or international uh, dimension is not easy. And when we talk about resilience, uh, of course, the COVID crisis has a huge impact, even though, like Olga said, in France, we have strong public support and strong policy measures, but it still is going to be hard uh, locally. So how can Europe help and how did Europe help us uh, with this uh, resilience and these uh, new initiatives? Of course, we have uh, ideas and recommendations that comes from the European guidelines. One interesting uh, is uh, the, the report that was made on the governments for cultural heritage, which we used uh, for our specific uh, sector which was focused on the visual arts, but we have some very good recommendation that can be used. And of course, the European projects, um, we uh, as TVT Innovation are partners in different European projects, some uh, dealing with cross-fertilization, uh, like the co-create one, others that are more oriented on tools like design thinking tools and methodologies, like the DESALT, and this one we are talking about today, which is the SMAT uh, projects, where we were partner, but also coordinator of one uh, important work package, which was the coaching of the, um, of the entrepreneurs and the projects, the creative projects. So it allowed us, and that's what I wanted to illustrate, um, to create this Toulon Var creative nest. Um, I love the fact that indeed, it's not just another new incubator. It's something that is different. It's, it's more of a nest. It's something that is harder maybe to get, but more in interesting, I think, sometimes in terms of sustainability. We were able to do it, binding innovation, our innovative ecosystem, which, because we are a business innovation center where we work with uh, startups. We work with innovation stakeholders. We work within innovation, regional, European, and international networks. But we were also uh, able to bind this ecosystem and make them meet uh, the artistic and cultural ecosystem uh, that was close to Le Port des Créateurs, which is our um, city's uh, cultural incubator. And that, that was for us something, um, something interesting. And we used this math model. So I'm going to show you how uh, the Toulon Var creativeness was elaborated. But first was really a work done on the, the governance. Um, we did it with, as all the other partners, but focusing really on four main steps, identifying our stakeholders, both public and private, Finding a common vision, we work on uh, allocating the resources and sharing knowledge and opportunities so each participant inside the nest would get something out of it and would want to come and to participate. So that, so that, in, that was the interesting part of getting people together, both from the innovation e ecosystem from the cultural artistic e ecosystem and both from the public side and the private. 
some had never met and it was the first time they were able to meet, even if they did work uh, on cross activities that could be very interesting. Once the nest was established, we were able to launch a call for proposal uh, to support and sustain creative and innovative project from our territory. We called it uh, the Creative Starter Program. And that was for us a very interesting pilot initiative where both Le Port des Créateurs and TVT Innovation worked together uh, on all the different aspects uh, trying and testing new ways to support the entrepreneurs, new way to make them uh, meet interesting people. With the study visit, they were able to go in very interesting, both public and private cultural heritage sites. Uh, we were also uh, able to find new ways to finance these projects coming from our innovative ecosystem. Investors were able to look at what those new creative uh, and artistic projects we're doing. So you will be able uh, to check out the different projects that were promoted within the SMATH uh, European initiative uh, that are projects that are cultural based, but that are proposing new and innovative services. Um, and that could be useful for the Mediterranean area and abroad. So this is the website, uh, www.creativenest.eu. That is the platform for the Creative Nest and for their project. So don't hesitate to please uh, go online and check the different projects uh, to see, uh, to get a bit more information about the Nest and their associated projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leticia, for your uh, um, presentation. Um, it was uh, interesting to, to find out the way um, in the last two years it really it developed the, the creative and cultural uh, industry. And I will have a question about that a little bit later. Now, uh, I would like to invite, uh, finally, but not the least, um, Wifre Veloso from Barcelona Activa uh, to talk about how they are tackling innovation and also how the COVID crisis affected the cultural sector in Barcelona. You have to turn on your microphone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so I would like to talk about the, the business side. So I will introduce the open innovation. Uh, open innovation follows the paradigm that the companies want to use external ideas to boost their uh, competitive advantage. No? The tool to promote open innovation is corporate venturing that allows established companies access form of innovation that are impossible to produce internally. Yeah? Corporate venturing is the framework for collaboration with, with, between innovative and disruptive startups uh, and large corporations. Internally, the companies, the companies need to identify opportunities for collaboration by uh, observing internal bottlenecks or incorporating the startups to the company so efficient as possible. Hackathons, accelerator programs, incubators, Venture builders, venture clients are the mechanisms used by the corporate venturing. Some examples at the local level that we have uh, in Barcelona, we have seen in Barcelona, is the Primavera Pro, is an event in, in uh, the Primavera Festival, uh, where uh, take place in the in in Primavera Pro. It's uh, for mu professional musicians. Or, or business or startups related to this to this sector. In the other hand, is uh, Sonar Plus D that's in the same way. They are using uh, high tech companies and showing in their festivals. There are also programs of uh, La Fundació Catalunya Cultura or corporate venture of, for example, Planeta Group, uh, one of the biggest book publishers. Uh, companies in Spain, uh, they are also open a fabric, this is their corporate venturing. 
and all of these uh, actions are part of the same direction no? open innovation they need they need to stay next to the startups to continue innovating innovating in format procedures uh, internationalization and marketing no uh, the smart pro uh, introduces the notion of nest a cross-cutting concept with the aim of promoting the hybridization between established companies and startups in the CCA sector. The SMAT uh, program has worked hard on the relationship with, with the start and cities ecosystem, public and private entities, with uh, a lot of presentation and contacts uh, with the participants of the SMAT, of, of the SMAT program, with, the, for example, the Catalan Institute of uh, Culture Companies, uh, the most important uh, private investment, investment network in Catalonia, ESADE, ESADE Bank, Business Angels Network. Uh, it's one of the biggest uh, um, universities in Barcelona with the biggest uh, cultural crowdfunding platform in Spain. Uh, it's called Vercami or Explicit Corporation corporations of great relevance like Primavera Sound or, or like Sonar. Or they are partnership from all program. All this with the support of the audiovisual cluster. Uh, in fact, uh, the person uh, from the cluster is a member of the scientific, scientific math project. No? We are uh, really linked to the, the ecosystem of, of the city. In terms of hybridization being with companies, they have contact with municipal markets or museum, design museum or ethnological museum or audiovisual festival such as uh, the Docs for uh, documentary festival, uh, for example. In fact, some of these entities uh, plan to hire some smart participants. So the, the relationship uh, with the ecosystem has some uh, success, uh, uh, to, has some uh, golden references. Even during the initial stage of the 25 selected project, some of them have hybridated with each other, such as Propera, which promote uh, the opera in the streets, and Shiver, which promotes a digital or virtual reality platform to enjoy the scenic arts. So there were a mix, uh, 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 hybridization between companies, but also between participants. The project uh, have complete an accelerator program working on business plan, the financial plan, uh, working on an elevator pitch and follow up tutorials. Eh? They are now in the third and final phase uh, of the program and uh, they try to establish with uh, contact with uh, co established companies and boost the internationalization. I only want to mention three uh, examples of, of our SMAT participants. Film Club is uh, the first one. It's a digital uh, content producer for schools. Eh? They began a new uh, investment round with the support of a crowd equity platform, La Bolsa, La Bolsa Social, and expecting to leverage this private investment with public uh, funding, with a participatory loan of uh, the Cultural Institute of Cultural Enterprises of, of, of Catalonia. There also has uh, the Planet Group, uh, Planeta Group, this big, big book publisher, uh, has shown interest in the company, but uh, COVID-19 has stopped the, the whole process because the big companies are also really affected by, by COVID-19. Um, on the other hand, we have worked also with a dark, dark Sense project. Uh, they are to develop a video game for blind people and is in contact also with Institute of uh, Cultural Companies to apply for a participatory loan and in contact with major publishers to develop their project. 
is also they are in contact with a large corporation such as ONCE, it's the lottery company promoted by people with disabilities. And uh, it's a huge and powerful uh, company and they are in contact with them just to, to develop the, the project. And finally, uh, Chiquita Room, an innovative art gallery, has developed a new instrument to uh, raise funding for visual artists along with uh, sponsors. Sponsors uh, pay this 50% of, uh, at first time, the sponsors pay 50% of the artist's work in advance. So uh, the artist can uh, found their promotion uh, at the art first. And if the artist sells the work, the sponsor makes money while the artist writes funding to assure the, his presence at the art first. Okay, and finally, another project is also a uh, Cucafera, a book publisher for kids, will start her uh, crowdfunding campaign through Berkami because of uh, her participation in the SMART program. So I think that we reach this aim to, to put in contact with the whole ecosystem and big companies, uh, the participants of this math. Eh? And COVID-19, it's uh, I think has affected uh, this, uh, this program too. Eh? and especially also the CCIs, uh, the difficulty of defining CCIs due to the impact of uh, digitalization on all parts of the CCI value chains, marketing, production and design, COVID has done nothing but speed up this process that already takes place. Huh? Digitalization, all of these companies that has participated in the smart company, they are boosting the digitalization part. Uh, book publishers or digital content or, or, or for example, Field Club is throwing its content online for uh, confined stu students. So this is uh, the adapt uh, of the companies to, to this situation. Uh. Private investment in general and specifically in cultural companies has been frozen due to COVID. Venture capitals are working on their portfolio nowadays of invested companies and corporates are either, uh, re, uh, rescheduling their content G plans and perhaps uh, contests with the startup will not appear as a priority. But anyway, we are in contact. We are trying to make this hybridization with uh, big companies, established companies and, and, and startups or companies, uh, participant uh, companies from this math uh, program. And uh, what we are doing as uh, public entities, uh, Barcelona Activa and ICUP, eh? uh, they are uh, developed uh, some uh, policy instruments just to, to help to boost uh, the, the CCI sector uh, because of the COVID-19. Eh? First one is clustering of uh, the sector to promote its internationalization and take advantage of synergies between companies. Eh? We will establish a new incubator in the Museum of uh, Design in the Glorious Square near to the city center as for CCA companies. Eh? It's important for the city as uh, we don't need more uh, big uh, industrial companies. We need to develop uh, CCA companies uh, strong than, than we can. We also have a Crea Media program as a benchmark for accelerator, acceleration of cultural companies. It will be quite near and quite similar to a SMAT program but uh, with more established and more regularity, uh, accelerate on program. Uh, ITEC is the uh, Institute of Cultural uh, Companies of uh, Catalonian government, has launched grant, uh, grant program for cultural companies, both uh, for freelance workers and limited companies that has previously applied for aid for the Effect, eh? The grants are from 600 to 330,000 euros. Eh? 
there are loans to provide liquidity uh, from uh, a specific uh, liquidity uh, funding lines from the uh, Institute Catalan de Finances, the Finance Catalan Institute, uh, from 20,000 20, euros to 300 keys, and with an assume, uh, with a, a risk assumption of 80% of the loan. Eh? And also, ECUP has launched uh, uh, their program to support uh, CCI companies in Barcelona City, just for example, rescheduling the Greek festival that takes place now, but it will be in September, um, uh, just giving the possibility to 80 uh, shows, uh, showing 80, see, organizing 80 shows with uh, most of the uh, of the companies, of the uh, theater companies that are working in the city. So giving them the possibility to show their work uh, as, as extent they can, okay? And they also are giving extraordinary grants for cultural projects, okay? This is uh, more or less what we want to talk about, okay? So thanks a lot for your attention. And if you yeah. have any doubt, I would pleasure to... Yes, yes, we do have some questions. Thank you for your uh, intervention, Guifre. And uh, as long as we are on the topic of, uh, of uh, affected uh, enterprises by, by the COVID crisis, I would like to ask the question to Antonis. Um, because there are projects that you said in your presentation that already started the implementation phase. And I wanted to ask, how are you coaching projects that were relying to the internationalization, you know, for the travel, for the tourism, uh, for their target groups, uh, and that are affected by the COVID crisis? What advice do you give to them? Okay, uh, concerning uh, the phase of mentoring, coaching, and uh, supporting of uh, these groups, the, the the main method is to digitalize the services to them but this is not the problem the problem is that uh, the target groups are groups that are mostly affected uh, uh, of uh, covid-19 so uh, the main problem is to revise to hybridize to digitalize to make digital their uh, application, their ideas and their projects, and this is an opportunity uh, for them to to be more digital and to to have a, another uh, solution or an alternative solution, also for the time after the crisis of COVID. So this is uh, the one thing. Um, I, I take this opportunity to, to, to mention something that is of importance and relative to the question. Technopolis is uh, coordinating, uh, in, like the uh, beginning of this year, a big Creative Europe project in the music sector named uh, uh, Hubs for Exchange of Music Innovation. Uh, in this project, Ten country, uh, nine countries from all the eastern axis of Europe are taking place, from Estonia to Greece, through Poland, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Hungary, and so on. Uh, and uh, two weeks ago, we had uh, uh, organized the so-called Athens Music Week uh, that uh, finished with the European Music Week on the 21st of June. And uh, we have made all digital. And in this uh, sm very small time, we had to organize and to reorganize all the event. We have succeeded to have 28 webinars with participants from all over Europe, not only the countries that participate in the project, 15 groups that have send the so-called live concerts to us and uh, we have a digital show them. And uh, last but not least, 27 
municipalities, Greek municipalities, have attended this event digitally. So the opportunities are the, the fact that you can reach a wider uh, audience that was previously inaccessible because you had to travel and you had uh, you know the the time difference and also the the cost and now it was uh, all of a sudden everything accessible because you could connect from your couch and and uh, take part in a in a very wide european event so yes thank you um uh, my next question is for uh, for uh, professor panozzo how was the reception of, uh, of the SMAS idea uh, within the industry actors, because um, uh, as we saw from your presentation, uh, you had a very, uh, a very uh, successful match between industry actors and artists and um, uh, creative uh, entrepreneurs. And uh, I was wondering how did the industry receive the, the idea of, uh, of uh, SMAT's model? Uh, it, it depends. Uh, we, we, we kind of developed uh, an interpretive uh, theory, if you wish, that uh, the further they are, the better they relate. In the sense that we've seen that industries that have nothing to do historically or product-wise or process-wise with art, they get very interested in this because that's disruptive. Okay, so we, we give full meaning to the notion of disruptive. When you approach something that, that never touched upon your organization up until that moment, then you are shocked in a way. And, and if you manage that shock correctly, you can extract something good. While, and then you have a range of possibilities and, and, and I think the most critical level is when you, you try to put together firms that already think they are creative because they are into design, because they are into jewelry or fashion. And, and it's true, they have a history of relationship with the aesthetic, symbolic dimension and, and paradoxically, in those cases, it is a bit more difficult to create the connection because to put it simple, the entrepreneur, the firm, think they are artists already. So they don't need artists because they are, uh, which again, problematizing, problematizes the notion that we use too easily of CCIs. And CCIs is, is something that we should we should move away from, I think, in the future. And in fact, the European Commission is talking about CCS, cultural and creative sector, which is, I think, I think more illustrative of what we have there. Thank you, thank you very much for your input. Um, I would like to ask a, a, a next question uh, regarding the, you know, the, this, the, the territories and the local uh, realities um, to Vladimir to ask if, uh, because Maribor is not the, the capital of, of Slovenia and, and uh, to which extent is uh, Maribor um, a CCI territory? So, because you said you had uh, uh, small difficulties in, uh, you know, in, uh, in trying to promote the, the project within uh, the industry actors, uh, you know, to adhere to this idea. And I wanted to know is, is CCI, like a cultural and creative industry, something that is uh, very new, totally new and emerging, or maybe it was uh, dormant and now is waking up? Actually, it's, it's not totally new. I mentioned before that there were several activities in the past, but uh, we must know the Slovenia itself, it's a small country. We are 2 million people, 2 million inhabitants. And this means it's very small market. This, uh, this is also the reason why we are very open, uh, but um, we, cannot, we cannot start in promoting, we couldn't start promoting project in the whole Slovenia. So we selected the companies actually, the initiatives that are coming from the Maribor or the Podravia region. And after that, we have been involving actually the 
whole national territory to find partners. I think this is very important because, um, yeah, looking for a, a critical mass of the territory or the market, it's of the huge importance. But even, I would say, in, yeah, from the very first beginning, we were also thinking a little bit cross border. Maribor is very near to the Austrian border, so many projects have been developed also in the way that we are active and open to our colleagues in, in Austria. So it's um, especially for, for the industry we are targeting, uh, there, are, there are actually no borders. It's just the situation that we are now at the moment, uh, it's, it's changed significantly. I think not just here in Maribor or in Slovenia, it's changed in all the countries. So the national initiatives, national activities have been actually becoming much more stronger. So it, it's also a huge question uh, how this process will go then in, in, the, uh, in the other way, again, back to the, to the global or uh, European market. So it's very unpredictable uh, what consequences we will have in the future. Unpredictable, but at the same time, we should try to predict <laughs> the unpredictable. Yes, of course, it's, 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 not, it's not that we would say this is the solution. I think it is, it is like how, somehow like it was mentioned before with the, with the model of design thinking we're also using. Uh, so we are preparing ideas, we are preparing maybe proposals, we are testing them and then from the reaction of the market and the partners, we see if we have to change the approach and uh, we're trying to do this as quick as possible. It means develop idea, we are testing them, and then we hope to come to a model in the next month. So we will see it's quite interesting situation we have. Thank you very much for this input. Um, my next question would be to Leticia. Uh, also concerning the, the territory and the fact that uh, it's a really emerging uh, uh, field the creative industries in Toulon. Uh, my question is, is the creative industry or the innovative industry at the heart of the local and or regional metropolitan strategy? Because you said you have the, the new incubator and the new, so you have like a, a whole area that uh, has totally uh, uh, boomed uh, in the city. So I wanted to know if this is something that's coming from the actors, the entrepreneurs, or is it a something piloted from, from, from a local regional level. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's like you said, it's relatively new. Um, we've been uh, the economic development agency because uh, Toulon became a metropolitan area only two years ago. And same, the business, uh, the innovation, the, sorry, cultural incubator opened two years ago. What happened is first they had to focus on urban uh, planning because the city was really, uh, really needed urban planning, architecture and urban planning. Then uh, they worked on economic development, then on tourism activities. And now finally, everything linked to the cultural sector is starting to be underlined and it is starting to be for the politician, something uh, they are starting to invest in. But of course, thank God, um, the artists and entrepreneurs uh, from the creative and cultural sectors were in Toulon before the politicians started uh, working with them because Toulon is still very accessible. The rents are very accessible. You can have an art factory and a workshop for decent uh, prices. And the Toulon city is absolutely uh, in a beautiful setting next to the Mediterranean area with a lot and, uh, of great potential. When, what was good is that when uh, the politician and the metropolitan area uh, started working on the cultural subject, they first uh, thought about the training and they had the possibility to work on uh, with, uh, to get very uh, important schools. For example, the Camondo uh, Design School is the first uh, one 
after Paris that is opening, it's opening in Toulon. So you can see some things are changing. Uh, the art school has finally brand new uh, uh, facilities inside the, the, uh, the creative districts. Um, and our uh, innovation ecosystem is finally supporting and trying to work uh, with the cultural sector uh, knowing that it, it has important spillover effect and knowing that for social cohesion and our territorial identity is something that is interesting. Of course, Europe, uh, regional strategies, the, 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 what they, they called then uh, the local economic uh, strategy in this new metropolitan areas, uh, they are now underlying support for the creative cultural sector. And specifically, specifically with the help of this math project inside this very interesting visual art um, activities. Thank you for, for this answer. And this is a very smooth transition toward my, my last question to Aurélie, because we were talking about politicians and you are working for the Ministry of Culture and Communication in France. And the, the, the last question is, is there a risk that culture uh, and innovation be perceived only as a lever of, uh, for the development of other economic sectors such as tourism or hotels or industry and lose its original meaning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what would be the original meaning of culture? <laughs> uh, well, I believe it will be providing meaning uh, and symbolic value for people, uh, uniting them. Um, so is there a risk of, of losing this meaning uh, in, in commercial uh, issues or in tourism or auto, etc.? Uh, yes, I believe there is a risk. Uh, I believe we have to address this risk like any other risk. Um, you know, the thing with culture is that you can have many numbers on the turnover that is done on, I don't know, the GPD, etc. But what is very difficult to evaluate is does it provide meaning for people individually? And uh, we have to, at the same time, know what our numbers are in order to uh, show it's important and also keep a bit of distance from the uh, numbers in order to uh, let the culture live uh, and not, you know, uh, take it captive in very precise numbers of, uh, okay, so... Uh, uh, We've done that and it has uh, amounted to this. Um, so to address it, I think we need uh, several things. First, big budgets. Uh, <laughs> second, not cutting lines of these budgets because the more precise you get in what you want to finance and the less innovating you are and the less uh, margin of maneuvers there is for artists to express themselves. Um, and then maybe on the longer term, I think we need both uh, education in art, because what we want is to have citizens which are very criticism, like critics uh, towards us, and that tells us that, no, this is a policy that is turning us, our city into Disneyland. Uh, we don't want it. So we need to have people which are educated to art and which will be very harsh on us uh, to elaborate our policies. And also we have to uh, take care of artists and of their independence. So, um, you know, make sure that they have a good social protection uh, for the times where they are unemployed. And uh, we have a system in France, uh, you know, for making sure that they keep uh, getting uh, fees uh, like of unemployment. And uh, yeah, on the longer term, you know, having uh, a population which uh, craves for art and artists which are independent and have a means to create uh, is, uh, is very important, even though they're not always uh, employed. Thank you very much for this uh, for this uh, very interesting answer. Yes, it's it it is an interesting thing because we in France have this this idea of uh, it's important to educate educate art, but it is not the reality in in some countries, uh, not necessarily European Union countries, but also uh, uh, international uh, international wise. And uh, maybe we can also start by educating uh, world leaders 
about the, <laughs> the necessity of educating art and cultivating. Yes, because in, in the COVID crisis, uh, people, uh, the, the, the artists were, uh, I think, not the, the last, but be in, the, in the least um, uh, in, uh, seen um, categories as impacted, although they were like, they're, they're, they totally stopped their activities. And so people were like, why should we fund uh, uh, artists and pay for, for unemployment for artists? Uh, because it's not an essential uh, service. But uh, uh, if you can try to stop listening for music or read a book uh, uh, for a whole day, uh, then we can see uh, how, how can we deal with everything without art. So we, it's everywhere around us and we don't even see it anymore. So thank you very much for your input. And now I would like to ask Kami to say uh, two or three words uh, as a conclusion and to, to announce the break because we're already a little bit behind schedule. Yeah, th this question is, is, is quite interesting because currently the general perception is that the arts and uh, culture are, are very marginal in terms of economic contribution, uh, despite the, the figures. So it, it, it's important to have a, a global economic approach to, to culture, but not to reduce culture to this uh, only aspect. Uh, it would also be interesting to, to have uh, indicators to evaluate the, the non-quantifiable uh, aspect of the, of the impact of culture uh, on the territory, because uh, these indicators does not currently exist. And maybe it can be an interesting way to, to have a global uh, vision on, of what culture represents in territories. Yes, it is indeed something to think about, uh, maybe for our friends at the French Ministry of Culture, <laughs> a new idea to develop a study <laughs> on this. Um, uh, yes, uh, so thank you very much for your uh, great presentations, your inputs, your uh, answers and your, your feedbacks. Um, now we will announce a five minute break uh, and we will proceed with our second part of the European Congress. So um, I will uh, uh, say that I will meet you all back in, in five minutes uh, here live on the YouTube channel of, channel of Paul Culture et Patrimoine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Olga, for your organization. And if you had the possibility to give us a virtual cup of coffee, it will be great. We can definitely do that offline. <laughs> Thank you.
Hello, we are back from the break with our experts uh, for the second part of our European Congress on Culture and Innovation, where we are welcoming speakers from public and private cultural institutions to question the way in which the cultural sector can be a real catalyst of innovation in favor of territorial development as well as social technological or artistic development. We would like to introduce the, the keynote of Maciej Hoffman, who works as a policy officer at the European Commission's Directorate General for Education and Culture, where he is responsible for managing initiatives related to the role of culture in the cities and regions, access to culture via digital means, as well as support to cultural and creative sectors, and he will speak about European Union's cultural policy, context, key themes, role of cities and regions, funding for innovation and culture. Maciej, you have the floor. So, small uh, technical issue. Okay. Where is Maciej? Okay, Maciej is uh, supposed to present, uh, to have a, a presentation about the, um, about uh, financial perspectives for the programming period 2021 and 2027 of the structural funds addressed to innovation and cultural sectors, as well as to give an understanding of how the COVID crisis affected the cultural sector in Europe in general and how the European institutions are acting through its financial mechanism. So um, I don't know where, uh, where Maciej is, but we are waiting for him. Uh, maybe we can go to the intervention of our uh, three participants from the from the round table maybe we can start with the round table and finish with the with the keynote from the european commission we always you know uh, have uh, sometimes small technical issues it's not uh, obvious to to deal with the events uh, at the distance so i would like to uh, welcome right now um, speakers uh, from uh, for our next intervention we just switched a little bit. So the round table of how to facilitate the innovation, innovation processes in the cultural sectors. And we have the, the honor uh, to welcome the very important speakers uh, from uh, public and private institutions, uh, cultural institutions in France. So we have Marta Gillette in French, uh, director at National School of Photography in Arles, uh, and Yannick Vernet, head of Fab Lab and Innovation also at the National School of Photography in Arles. We have also uh, Mustafa Boyati, CEO uh, of uh, Luma Arles. Uh, we also have uh, Laurence Lenny. I think uh, she will connect, uh, she has some issues with the connection. She will join us a little bit later. Uh, she is the vice president of Startup Ecosystem Orange. And we also have Roy Amit, director of digital at Réunion des Musées Nationaux, Grand Palais. Uh, so um, I will ask Marta to start her presentation uh, about, the, about the National School of Photography. Uh, thank you, Olga, and uh, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm glad to be here without being here. Um, I'm Marta Gilly. I'm, uh, I'm director of National School of uh, Photography in Arles, which is a um, uh, national school under the edges of a Minister of Culture, uh, French Minister of Culture, Arles, which is, which is uh, in the south of France. Um, we have a school uh, with uh, around 130 students uh, that could um, have a master degree or a PhD courses on research 
as well as uh, continuous formation, uh, what they say about uh, uh, professionalization and uh, mentorship residencies. Uh, the main goal of the school is to provide to students interdisciplinary approaches to images, photography and time-based media uh, in order to explore uh, expanded fields of knowledge and artistic practices. Um, our schools are often uh, considered uh, by many people as a, like a kind of a dark places huh? where uncommon people are producing eccentric objects or strange uh, images in our case. And we think on the contrary, uh, we think that this is true. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is true that the, the, this, the, there is this kind of, of uh, perception of our schools. And um, we think that on the contrary, the art schools must be a places to reconsider our lives lived today. And I am sure that, um, that you will agree with me, uh, our lives today uh, are more awkward than any art school, aren't they? So seriously, more than ever, I think that art schools have to become places of uh, of sharing knowledge, of uh, research, of um, emotions, uh, the place where we can uh, express our fears and our desires. So they have to be open to contribute with their artistic researches to design what we call uh, the alternative ways of living together and uh, be open to all kinds of uh, people interested in changing our life in the planet for good, forever. So this is the reason that the, the lead uh, idea of, uh, the lead idea of the creation of the Fab Lab that uh, Yannick is going to present to you. Uh, this Fab Lab is in the, inside the school and is a, uh, open place not only for the school students, but also uh, for a large audiences, people of all ages or people of uh, all backgrounds in order to develop personal projects. Um, let's say like inventions or uh, experiments or uh, digital ideas or technical training that suddenly become less personal and more collective issues science and, te and technology, but also art and critical thinking uh, work together in many collaborative projects that expand our assumptions of academic knowledge towards the sensible enthusiasm of living a common project with all senses, not only the gaze, which is one of the senses that we use a lot at the images school, but all the kind of senses. And this is uh, our, uh, one of the, our main goals uh, for the Fab Lab. And I let maybe Yannick, if he, Olga, you agree, uh, to explain um, deeper, in a deeper way, what's, what is this Fab Lab? Yes, Thank yes. You. Thank you. Thank Yannick, you. go ahead. Thank you, Marta. To begin, I would like to start by thanking Camille Demange and Laetitia Bertrand and the entire ICP poll team and its uh, SMART project partners for organizing this very interesting conference. Thank you all. In this communication, I will tell you about the Fab Lab on the National Higher School of Photography through, oh, ah, okay, its videos, um, its values, our vision of social techno technological usage innovation in this place, its challenges, and uh, we'll list you quickly some project with an emphasis on Open Lab, which I think illustrates perfectly the subject of this conference. This communication should last seven or eight minutes. The ENSP Fab Lab is an environment of discovery, of learning, of manufacturing, of research, of sharing in the field of images, from ante photography to post photography. Each of these five missions is divided into structuring axes that are creation, monstration, mediation, publishing. A fifth transversal axis is that of documentation. More than a space, the Fab Lab uh, is a social configuration that is to say a relational structuring between singular individuals 
from the hyper specialist researcher to the most neophyte amateur. It allows people to meet and engage with them in the same trajectory, leading them to design and manufacture new forms of knowledge together, ideas, works, projects, devices. The Fab Lab promotes formal, non-formal, and informal inclusive learning. It allows the acquisition of knowledge, know-how, knowledge in transversal, multicultural, transgenerational, experimental, peer-to-peer -peer learning patterns. Less than the technologies, it is especially the human who it put forward in this environment. In this changing world, it is therefore necessary to think and animate new areas of reflection, of research and creation, put to the test of these challenges. This is the purpose of this Fab Lab. And for this, three main strategic axes are posed. That of the individual, that of communities, and that of society. Concerning the individual, it is a question of stimulating and favoring the creativity of the individuals who evolve within the Fab Lab, whatever their statue of their knowledge. Concerning communities, it is a question of federating around the Fab Lab communities of interest based on the specificity and the plurality of individuals. Recording society, the Fab Lab is about interacting with society and subscribing to major societal reflection. The Fab Lab imbues its action with value, which are in harmony with the requirements and the richness of its mission. The spirit of discovery encourage the desire to go beyond the know to discover the unknown and advanced knowledge, especially in the field of images. Continuous learning, inspiring the desire to learn and valuing knowledge transfer. Benevolent reception, encourage and recognize the active participation and contribution of users in the activities of the Fab Lab. The process of individuation, fostering the development of individuals and nourishing each project with their uniqueness. Collaboration, recognizing the rich and influence gained by working with other people or structures. The common, develop practice designed to promote the sharing development and dissemination of content and make it freely accessible to facilitate their use and collective improvement. Critical making, bringing an approach to creation where the final devices created are less more important than the critical exchanges and discussions between peoples. It's important for us to create a fab lab open to all and what activity formats will be able to attract heterogeneous audiences in the activities it offers. The Fab Lab aims to make a wide audience discover all in a set of reflection, questions, techniques, projects, papers, networks, experiments, creative environment linked to the stake of the contemporary images. As the learning methods, theoretical and critical, technical, methodological, have changed considerably since the advent of digital technology. It is important for a higher education institution to offer new formats that are in line with cultural, social, techno-scientific practice today. The Fab Lab must play this role. The Fab Lab must make it possible for citizens to reclaim technology by sharing knowledge, learning by doing, breaking down the silos of practice and fostering exchanges. The manufacturing processes within the Fab Lab are based on agile methods, which are iterative, incremental, and adaptative. A Fab Lab does not exist alone, but as a node in a wider network. Its success will hold in its faculty to link to research structure, research laboratories, universities, creation, school of art, art centers, manufacturing, other fab labs, craft workshop, cluster of enterprises like the PolyCP or Acumed here in Arles. The fab lab aims to be always in perpetual reconfiguration in relation to this ecosystem. The fab lab research projects 
will be as much part of participatory and collaborative dynamics as possible. More element of everyday life material and immaterial can be the, can be the subject of sharing logic and define a space that escapes the logic of exclusive ownership. The shared resources are organized and regulated by communities, large or small, local or widely distributed. Digital introduces a new opportunity by its additive and multipliable nature of its resources. The ENSP Fabla must continue its reflection on its participation in advance on the value of use of resources on the commons of knowledge, which are all source of initiative, creativity, and mobilization of individuals for our collective goals. The Fab Labs offer various activities apart from the courses given to students. Creative residents like the one we have been organizing for several years with the Festival des Sud in Arles, which consists of bringing a musician and a visual artist together. For information, uh, Intende Smith, a visual artist, and Gaspar Klaus, a musician, will be in Arles to start the first part of this residency. Biophotography workshop organized with our partners and friends of Atelier Luma. This workshop on biophotography aims to extend the reflection around the algae uh, as a marker of pollution in the territory. The question is, how can we use this biological photographic process to raise awareness of the risk of pollution, which remain largely invisible despite its ubiquity? We also organize workshops for school children, uh, as we did this year with the Collège Ampère and the Lycée Priva in Arles, of course. We have other activities, but let me to further illustrate this above remark allow to present the Open Lab, a type of activity which seems to me to answer more precisely, indeed, the description of innovation. This weekly meeting allows a mixed audiences. UNSP students, of course, and outdoor audiences from 20 to 65 years and more, years old and more, of a graduate or without diploma, women and men, people with disabilities or not, to work every Thursday from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. together on a joint project linked to the images. Concretely, this session allowed to implement a collaborative and experimental artistic project. Discover and learn about a, multi a multitude of technology by creating a functional prototype. Become a player in the digital manufacturing chain. Learn collectively about electricity, electronics, mechanics, robotics, programming, image processing, virtual reality in a friendly environment. And this is very important. Learn to learn by the experimental method, the search of for the necessary resource and the exchange with the other member of the group. Conceive technical solution to artistic issues. The smooth running of this project depend in part of the ability to find useful information, critical or theoretical, artistic and techno-scientific. In this open lab, for four years we have created a mobile robot that makes images using an artificial intelligence program. Realized a camera which transforms the visual into sound in real time. Imagine and make a plantoid, you know, a robot plant that interacted with a plant. The goal of this project is to see what kind of images could emerge from this exchange of information. And for this information, the possibility of bringing it to life on the blockchain. The last project still in progress because stopped due to confinement. It is a puppet made for biomaterials, the mycelium and bio tissue, the kombucha. This puppet transform a digital image into a living bioluminescent image. All these projects are carried uh, out by an audience of people from various backgrounds. Nothing is predetermined and everything is invented gradually 
over the weeks without individual skill at the start. Being neither often a researcher nor an artist, these people are embarking on a common trajectory which leads to the result which I have just told you about and which seems to me to illustrate this innovative approach of the Fab Lab in this territory. I hope that this presentation will have made you want to come visit us or participate in these activities of the UNSP Fab Lab. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Yannick, and thank you, uh, Marta, for your uh, uh, extensive presentations. And I, I would like to uh, literally and geographically go across the street and ask uh, Mustafa Boyati uh, from uh, Luma Arl uh, to talk uh, about how Luma is becoming uh, the innovative platform that questions the challenges of today's society. Thank you, thank you, Olga, and hello, everyone. Um, uh, and thank you, uh, Yannick, for the presentation. Very inspiring. Um, and, uh, we are literally uh, across the street of the school of the National School of uh, Photography, um, which is um, basically we are literally embodying the notion of cluster in Al. I mean, there is such a group of uh, amazing cultural actors and operators uh, who are very dynamic, very active. And uh, uh, Paul Isepe is obviously, you know, uh, a key member uh, of that uh, as well. Um, as Yannick said, uh, a cluster is a social space. Uh, it's a group of people interacting. Um, we'd like to think actually of Luma as a, a combination of clusters, a cluster of spaces because you know, in one single space uh, on the Parc des Ateliers, uh, we bring together um, uh, um, a collection of spaces, a collection of buildings of different types, different sizes, different qualities and types. Basically, they, they allow for uh, a very flexible approach and a multiplicity of, of potentialities and, and, uh, uh, and possibilities. Um, it is also a, a cluster of programs we have developed and we are still developing a certain number of activities to activate these spaces, to uh, inhabit these, spa these spaces. Um, these programs are uh, um, uh, a set of tools uh, that allow us to address all sorts of topics. And our approach to culture um, is uh, a very, very open one. Uh, uh, because we are convinced that culture allows transversality, allows uh, uh, um, interactions uh, between different disciplines. I heard the word silo in, in the previous uh, uh, panel discussion, and uh, culture is actually the platform that breaks these silos because we are all coming together to work uh, on a common goal or on a common vision, um, or at least interact or disagree uh, on a certain number of elements. Um, and through culture, we address um, all topics uh, of social living, of, of life, basically, uh, ranging from ecology, the environment, nature, um, but also uh, uh, human rights, um, inequalities, social justice, uh, and so on. Um, that obviously touches on science, and all sorts of disciplines. So it's really an interdisciplinary platform that we are trying to build. It is interdisciplinary because we have built empty spaces uh, that don't have a dedicated use. Um, and, this, uh, and this actually is uh, 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 allowing for the maximum flexibility. Um, and, and to us, um, we didn't want to build something that, uh, you know, the perspective was not to innovate. The perspective was to create the conditions and create a bit of an ecosystem that allows for things to happen, for interactions to operate um, and, and for exchanges uh, to happen. Um, uh, obviously in that, the idea is to uh, uh, have a certain number of, uh, uh, of uh, set ideas uh, where we are working with confirmed artists, but we are also reaching out to younger ones. 
um, we are uh, developing uh, a school, for example, to bring people that do research. Uh, and we are also producing shows with, you know, artists who, who, uh, whom people would have seen in other bigger institutions uh, um, uh, around the globe. Um, one key element uh, to us in, in the way we, we, we approach things is, uh, and especially in France, uh, where everything is centralized and, and uh, concentrated in bigger cities, um, uh, we, and Maya Hoffman, uh, has decided to develop the project we are developing in a smaller city, you know, 30, 000, 35,000 or 55,000 inhabitants, depending on the scale we want to look at. Um, and, and that in itself is, is a statement. Um, uh, developing such an ambitious project with, uh, while keeping up the high standard of quality and excellence is uh, another statement. Um, very much and very often in France, unfortunately, when seen from bigger cities, whatever happens, you know, in smaller towns is considered as, you know, a bit too amateur and not professional enough. And we are convinced that actually, you know, uh, the potentialities and possibilities uh, now exist in smaller cities. And I say now, we started in 2009 um, and we have been developing the project over time. Um, but uh, it's a conviction that has uh, been confirmed uh, actually uh, over time. Um, uh, there is a bit of a saturation in, in capital cities and, and, and big metropolises. And uh, I think the possibility that, uh, that is still present in smaller towns just because of different ways to interact, different approaches uh, and, and, and ways to deal with time um, uh, is, is, is an asset that is very difficult actually. You can formulate it, but as long as you haven't experienced it, people are not aware of it. Uh, and it is a key element actually, uh, and a key ingredient in uh, uh, the way things uh, can happen and uh, innovation uh, can happen. Um, obviously, uh, we, over time, we were faced with a certain number of, uh, um, I wouldn't say limits because uh, we have been able to go over uh, the limits, but it's more obstacles. And these obstacles have been more like, you know, mental interpretations or understandings or representations of what is possible uh, or not. Or what do people in smaller cities allow themselves to think or ambition? Um, and I think it is a key element actually in, in, uh, in the minds uh, uh, of people, which very often is um, or prevents uh, ideas and 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 uh, or actions uh, to progress and and and, uh, and develop. Um, to us, what we have been, you know, focusing on uh, is actually um, making sure that we develop a project that grows organically from the ground where it has been built. Um, it is essential, so the project very much reflects the territory where it's been developed. Um, Yannick has mentioned uh, one of the projects and one of the programs we have, which is called Atelier Luma, where we have been developing um, uh, biomaterials uh, from local natural resources, uh, making uh, a sort of bioplastic out of algae, uh, making a sort of... Uh, styrofoam out of uh, sunflower seed and stem, um, uh, making uh, 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 building material out of salt. Uh, um, these are immediate and natural ingredients who are there and who have never been used, never been used because local people have never been able to see them in a different way uh, than you know they are because they are taken for granted somehow, um, or never been used because uh, um, uh, yeah, the change of perspective on these elements and also probably the evolution of time and technology uh, has allowed for that. We brought in people, uh, you know, creative minds that we brought together with scientists that we mixed with uh, uh, local um, uh, uh, agricultures and in the exchange 
uh, of experience and the identification of needs uh, and uh, and uh, yeah the, the 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 friction between uh, each one of these has you know allowed us to grow and come up with a response uh, or uh, a variety of uh, uses for these materials that were not even identified as valuable before. Um, so this is one aspect of you know uh, what we're doing, and basically we're trying to do that in all sorts of uh, of fields uh, we are touching upon. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's um, uh, how do you develop uh, an innovative platform? Uh, I don't think that there is uh, you know a recipe for it. Uh, I think it's really um, uh, um, yeah creating. The, uh, the adapted environment with the proper ecosystem uh, for it to happen. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mustafa. And to, to rebound from, from your last phrase, how to create a, an, an innovative platform, I would like to invite Laurence Lenny, VP of Orange, an ecosystem startup, to say how they are supporting starts up, startups that create uh, creative content. Okay, hello. Uh, very pleased to be with you. So, um, speaking about uh, innovation, uh, it's uh, it could take a long time for Orange because uh, you know, for essence, uh, Orange is an uh, innovative um, actor. Actor. Uh, so, um, I will focus more um, because I'm in charge of a relationship of uh, uh, startup in the field of entertainment culture at Orange Content. Uh, so I'm working with all our affiliates in uh, Europe and the Middle East and Africa to provide, to, to find uh, the best uh, services for our customers. But uh, I will uh, tell you about uh, the way uh, Orange uh, is working with a startup. So Orange has for several years uh, develop a strategy to support startup uh, to and um, by providing uh, various uh, tools. It's a business issue, majority, but also it's a brand issue for us. So um, we we define different areas where we are going to 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 help and source uh, the, the innovative, the new uh, innovation services. Uh, and mainly uh, the field of so, so the way we are going to, to change uh, the, our work, the way you, we work, and uh, we, we, we test it <laughs> now, still now, uh, with, uh, during the, the crisis. Um, so um, then we, we, in, we select them. We integrate the startup likely to lead them into our ecosystem. So through different uh, tools and uh, first support is uh, accelerators and incubators in uh, Europe. In each country we have one and we have partnership in Europe, in uh, Middle East and Africa. We also provide assistance, material assistance with, um, with uh, for example, the provision of uh, API for the developer community and financial assistance too, with our range of digital investment, but it's uh, you know for startup which are mature, and today uh, we didn't do any except one or two in um, in the cultural um, in cultural field. Uh, but um, and this year we, we are going to start and to develop uh, you know a new action. Because we are going to um, to launch Orange Digital Center uh, to um, in each country, uh, gathering all innovation on one roof, and um, so the, the accelerators, also coding school, and the Fab Lab. Because in each country and even in France, we have in each um, territories we have a partnership with a Fab Lab. So finally, we promote starts up by offering them privileged uh, access to markets, as well as by giving uh, them visibility with their target audiences on the international scene. So 
Today, about the field of cultural entertainment, um, I will focus on my uh, um, experience uh, because uh, I started to work at Orange 15 years ago and I was uh, head of music, uh, strategy, uh, product and services for the group. And, um, and uh, we have uh, the use at this time to develop our own inside, in-house, uh, the product and services. So it took time uh, and we were, we could say, uh, never time to market. So we decided when uh, we when the streaming it was a new usage of music, very new one, uh, even sometimes not legal, uh, we decided to, to, to do open innovation, even if at this time we didn't speak about open innovation. Um, and uh, Spotify, Deezer and Cobuzz were the newcomer um, in, uh, in this area. And so we decided to make a partnership with Deezer, with the French um, streaming services. Um, and um, it was a time uh, on when Deezer has to launch a premium offers. So it was 10 years ago, uh, already 10 years ago. And what I could say that it was a startup and the collaboration was really, uh, you know, um, uh, successful. Why? Because it came from first from a business perspective it was we need you know this kind of services and we decided not to do it uh, inside the, the company and uh, so uh, this collaboration was key for uh, emergence of the streaming music streaming in France and I could say that contribute to the return to growth of uh, music industry, we could say now for two years. Uh, and uh, by my experience, as I came before from the music industry, I was a managing director of Warner Music and Sony. So I knew well the, 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 the labels. And um, so this kind of deal was completely new. And uh, all the deal, my deal were validated by the headquarters of major company uh, in uh, in uh, US. Um, so it was completely new, uh, and it works also. Uh, so we decided also uh, for the books, um, the books, the readings, so press and books, we decided also to launch this kind of service. So it's, for us, it's more subscription model. Um, and we decided to launch also, uh, not in France because uh, they don't have the exhaustive, uh, exhaustive con um, content catalog, uh, because uh, on uh, the books editors, they don't want to have to replicate the music uh, models. So we launched um, Uscrib in, uh, in some countries in Africa, uh, French speaking countries, and it's really a successful, uh, successful also uh, partnership because uh, for them, it's really key to have a, um, a huge, uh, um, a huge, um, uh, subscribers' uh, possibility to propose their, their, their um, service. But uh, so, what I could say that it's also uh, key uh, for content services distribution to have uh, you know this kind of partnership with the telco uh, because uh, you know we often open new markets where, for example, digital market uh, never existed. So it's new income for the, the industries too. But it's a long way to do it, to, to target and, uh, and to obtain results. And it's why um, it's very difficult for us also to find, you know, uh, the, the, the good startup to provide 
a service with add value, with a, a new usage, and the usage should be today, you know, more mature than maybe 10 years ago, where there's not uh, open innovation for streaming, for example. One other key is that uh, you need to have a, a commitment on uh, investment in marketing and brand for the, the startup. So investment for the startup, money is key also to invest in marketing and brand awareness. That is key for, for that. Um, so uh, about, um, uh, about these two, uh, you know, successful uh, things, we had, we fell also in, uh, in uh, which um, in some um, startup uh, field because there was no, because it's difficult also to, to work with a corporate. Uh, you know, a corporate should be uh, agile, like we said, uh, to work with a startup, but a, a startup uh, have to be also strong in terms of uh, team and also in terms of uh, cash investment. Uh, and it's why also there is one uh, key issue we need to improve. It's the fact that for the startup, we have a good product, good service, maybe uh, some partnership with a corporate uh, to distribute. Um, it's very difficult for them to find uh, money. So you on seeds, investment okay uh, you have business angel we trust on you and uh, your product but to when you need to have more and you know um, more investment it's very very difficult why because of the comparison with uh, you know the tech startup uh, you know we could say the classic one uh, and Oftenly, uh, the, the, the investors they don't understand the the, the, the way uh, you know the, the creative industry works, because you have you know the startup, you have the distributor or uh, anyone else uh, you know who help you to to grow in your market, but also you have uh, you know that the right owners, and sometimes they don't understand that this third party. Who, who had, you know, the, the rights uh, for artists or for catalog, and you need it for your services. And I could say that it's the right on us you, you validate your business model. So it's key. It's uh, you know third parties uh, gaining together. You have to work together. So it just took time. And often, you know, the, the investor, they, you know, the timing for the investor is not the same. So, often, I say to the, the, the startup and also the, the investors, uh, the funds, that, uh, you know, the timing for developing a new media, it's not the same as the timing to develop, for example, the banking service or well, maybe not a banking service, but different tech services more uh, so and also it's take time and uh, we need strong sales and marketing uh, investment and team too because often uh, you know um, you know there is a lack of uh, in, in, uh, in the management and uh, and the team of strong uh, profile on marketing and sales and we need, because you need uh, to educate uh, the customer. And what is key, it's to transform them into paid subscribers. Um, so that it's, uh, it's fundamental. Uh, so TV also is a uh, key, uh, is key in convergent uh, strategy. And we need to provide for us as an operator uh, always we have to enrich our customers' experience. And to do that, we investigate emerging uh, business model. Uh, for example, today we are on VR, uh, on eSports, streaming video cloud, gaming, web channels, 
podcast and education uh, during the COVID crisis, uh, we could notice increased for uh, digital education services, for example, music learning services, MOOC. Uh, but the key is really to find the right pricing, even there is a pricing, for example, MOOC, because, for example, we, have, we develop um, MOOC services in partnership, uh, for example, with uh, RMN, with uh, today on, on this round table uh, with Roy, uh, but it's uh, not uh, owned by, um, by uh, Orange Content. Uh, so, so the business unit who developed uh, services, but it's more, uh, it's uh, managed by the foundation, Orange Foundation, who did a lot of things also for culture and music, but uh, it's uh, not uh, services. Um, uh, it's not services, it's not uh, paid services. But sometimes we have a look also on uh, this kind of services uh, or project who, who are helped by the foundation and uh, by the day uh, could uh, we see that there is uh, an opportunity uh, for uh, the owner of the project maybe to transform in, in a business. And for example, there is one uh, startup called Music Crab. Uh, Music Crab, it was a musician who, de who designed and developed an application uh, to learn uh, solfege and music. Uh, it's, it was done by a young guy uh, who developed uh, gaming. And uh, the application was free. Uh, you have a lot download, a lot of download, free download. The Orange Foundation helped uh, him uh, to develop uh, the premium, uh, premium application. And so now we are going to, uh, to discuss with our affiliates uh, to propose to, um, to distribute the premium services. You know, we have to do this kind of uh, story we could do. So um, that is it. So one key, I think, uh, to have for, for you know, developing great value, I think that I'm not on the same field I, as uh, different, but I think that the way it's to create value and, uh, and also that to understand that uh, the, the, there is artists there is right on us and we need to, to it's very important that uh, there is a, a good, um, also there is revenues, our revenue for them. So the business model is really key. And uh, it's why it's very difficult today, I think for startup to in, in a cultural and uh, I could say entertainment field, um, be, be successful. There is not a lot of uh, successful. For example, on uh, on movie, uh, you know, by Netflix, or, or but there is not a, there is a lot of uh, European uh, project and services, but uh, it's very difficult for them to be uh, successful in Europe and also across Europe. Uh, we, for example, we have um, we hope that it will be successful. We distribute um, uh, Artify with uh, SVOD, BVOD uh, um, services in uh, in Tunisia. So we hope that it will be also across uh, the, the the region. Um, so that I think that uh, I finished uh, my uh, contribution. Thank you very much, uh, Laurence. Uh, now, uh, I would like to make a smooth transition to Roy Amit's intervention, because you talked about your, your mutual collaboration, and I think it's very interesting to finish with, um, with uh, Roy's intervention. He is the head of digital at the Réunion des Musées Nationaux Grand Palais, uh, which is a public institution. So we'll see how the public institution is addressing innovation uh, at its heart of the, of the digital strategy and the transformation of, of, of this uh, institution. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Thank you all. Thank you, Camille. Uh, and, and indeed, the, yes, so you say that the RMN Grand Palais, we are a public institution that have several different types of activities. Um, 
mainly services for uh, other institutions and directed for the public in the area of fine arts. Uh, and when we are speaking of fine arts, there is an inherent uh, um, um, inherent co uh, dialogue between innovation and conservation. We are doing the same time heritage, patrimoine, uh, and in French you'd say conservateur, uh, for those who create and preserve art. Uh, so how we manage innovation and conservation uh, in this type of institution. And we are asking ourselves why, why to innovate? This is not just a philosophical question, uh, because we need we, we need to have some reason to do so, right? Um, so in, in in our in our case, uh, the answer is 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 quite simple. We must innovate in order to be up to the times we are living in, and we know that uh, time. Uh, um, is evolving, the definition of time. Uh, this is why uh, conservation and innovation goes together. In order to conservate, con you need to innovate. Um, and, and in digital uh, is, for the last years, is one of the major catalyzer or lever for uh, innovation. Uh, and, and again, this is quite uh, common today. Uh, ask ourselves why digital uh, uh, such, has a such intimate relation with innovation. Um, and in our domains, we can explain it because, um, first of all, it's everywhere, right? Uh, uh, I, I'm using to refer to, to the film maker, uh, let's say, the, the, Le Fond de l'Air est Rouge. So, the, on, on, the, the Fond de l'Air est, est digital. So it's a film of Chris Marker. Uh, uh, and, and we can say digital is everywhere um, and it is evolving very fast. But it's not just that, it's also because it's a very user centric uh, um, uh, mode. And this user centric that puts the, the user. Uh, the visitor, the artist, the people in the center is crucial. Um, and, and this is why uh, we take uh, innovation seriously. Uh, it's not just uh, it's not just a title. it's it's a, it's a mindset uh, that we are we are sharing at and we are trying to give it uh, um, content uh, in this in different type of, of characteristic. So what, what we're doing is to experiment, uh, uh, to, we fail and we experiment again. Uh, we are constantly looking for feedbacks, feedbacks from our visitors, from, from the artists we are working with, from, from other institution. So we have a real structure uh, ways to have these feedbacks. We're trying to be agile and to, to, to change it. And we also uh, um, try and evolve our organization. Uh, and, and as I said earlier, we are uh, at the same time public institution and uh, institution that doing with conser <laughs> conserving. So, uh, Changing organization is not uh, easy, but it's part of our, our method and objective in order to be able uh, to, to keep pace. Um, and, 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 and another type of, of characteristic is the, 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 the inspiration that's coming from the outside. Um, the same as, as uh, Laurence, the same as, as the Fab Lab, the same as when we are talking about inspiration, we know that uh, innovation is not just coming from the inside, from inside the organization, but coming from the outside. And this is why we are regularly working with startups, with uh, incubators, with other types of organization in order to uh, be able to innovate in our own uh, fields of action. And, and after having said that, 
perhaps just one example, a recent one that kind of uh, uh, federate uh, all of these ca characteristic um, in the sense of it's, it's, it's a big project. And, and when we talk about big, a big project, it includes many, many other projects inside it. And, and I'm referring to our uh, new exhibition um, about Pompeii that we just opened uh, yesterday in Paris. So I, I, I will, in, in a few words, and I, I just will try to uh, share my screen with you uh, in just to, to show you some slides um, about uh, about this uh, this project, um, I I lost my screen. You, uh, you see, yeah, I guess you see the the, the Pompeii screen, right? Yes, Olga. Um, so um, before speaking about the exhibition, um, we were we were uh, we we were scheduled to open the exhibition the end of March. Uh, and as you know, at the 17th of March, we were confined and we had to lock down the exhibition with its exhibit and everything and, and not to open it for the public. Um, so we have decided um, very quickly to uh, propose other types of experience, but to propose it online. And so in 10 days time, we actually recreate an, a Pompeii exhibition online. Uh, at the people house, we call it Pompeii Chez Vous, and it's uh, um, uh, a combination of different type of experience that uh, our visitors can live uh, and, and, and experience them uh, from their uh, uh, everywhere else, from their own home and, and sofas. Uh, so there is a, 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 a large type of content for a large type of interface and interaction, videos, podcasts, um, uh, games, uh, augmented realities, uh, uh, elements, VR possibilities to download and to use at home. Um, and uh, we had this very large uh, uh, success with over 1 million users uh, during these two months um, uh, that found each one a type or several types of content uh, that were uh, engaging and appealing for, 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 for their own use. Uh, how we managed to do so because two reasons. The first one is because this exhibition is a very digital one and I will speak about it in a minute. So we had a lot of material already in digital uh, formats, but also, and this is one of our innovation of last years, that we have a real uh, apprehension of our public as a public that is a 360 degree approach for its encounter with our content, with art. Our public is not just our public when it comes to our museums, our exhibition, it's our public also before and after, and even if it's very far away. So we have this vision that the public, and, and we've developed this vision last year as a real innovation uh, axis of our actions. So now when we develop content for uh, an on-site exhibition, we already developing content for all these uh, other types of uh, of interfaces and engagement. Uh, this is why we, we, we could uh, launch this uh, operation very quickly and, and still and continue to be uh, relevant, although everyone was confined and although the, the on-site exhibition was closed. Happily, uh, since several weeks now, uh, we are unconfined. I don't know how you say it in English. We are deconfined, and 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 happily, the sanitary situation is getting better, and we can open. Uh, we could open the exhibition, as I said yesterday, to the public, and it will 
stay open. And I will say a few words about this exhibition because it's another uh, type of major innovation in our field. Uh, why it's, it's a major innovation? Because it's not just about the object. It's not just about the, um, the conservation and the mediation uh, advocacy of an art object or archaeological object in this case. It's about a global experience. And, and I have some just few, um, few photos from this exhibition that opened uh, yesterday. Um, uh, it's it's uh, uh, a, a, a 360 degrees uh, exhibition that uh, I will say in French, mise en scène, um, that puts in architecture, that puts in, in into the space different types of media and objects. Uh, and it's a, 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 a new, we are talking a, a lot about immersive, now immersive exhibition, uh, a term that becomes a bit unclear. This is anyway our interpretation for what is immersive exhibition when we actually articulate at the same time immersive media environment with narration and information with objects as well and with engagement and interaction. So these three uh, aspects of emotion, information, interaction create a new type of uh, new type of visit, new type of, 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 of exhibition. And, and perhaps I, I, I will finish with it. It's, 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 it's one of our, our, our experience here. And this is an innovative experience that will continue because we are le still learning is how to design uh, um, the attention of our public in this evolving world of digital medias. And, um, and this new design of, of attention is, of course, related to what we said earlier on about the user-centric uh, of, of the digital and in this sense of the visitor centric uh, perspective that we are trying to 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 explore so uh, this uh, exhibition is open um, uh, to the public and we've launched as well uh, our studies uh, and feedback of the public right away uh, and we'll have lots of feedback uh, and we'll learn from, from it. And uh, of course, we'll try to, to, to make it uh, um, better for the next one. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Roy. And uh, I just wanted to say and to highlight the fact that the um, the fact that you said that uh, it's innovation and also conservation and heritage, uh, actually uh, the, the reflection that I was having is that today's innovation, today's legacy is going to be tomorrow's heritage. Because in 40 years, what we call now innovation, uh, it will be uh, heritage, patrimony, uh, and the legacy for the future generations. And the question that I had for everybody, um, and maybe you, you can take turns to, to answer, is really how do, you, how do you address the digital gap? The fact that by going digital, yes, you are working for the future generations and for the younger generations of today, but how are you ensuring the fact that the products you are creating are going to exist in 50 years? Because as we know, uh, with digital and with, with the electronics, uh, if we have a power surge or I don't know, if something happens, then you, you've lost, you've lost the, 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 the connection. Uh, so 
how how are you addressing these issues? Yes, and uh, I don't know who wants to go first. Um, I, per perhaps I just complete what I started. Yes. It, it, it was the same beforehand, right? When objects are there and, and, and Pompeii in a sense is a very interesting object because what happened there 2000 years ago, that one day, bam, eruption uh, and a whole civilization go under, under uh, you know, uh, 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 the volcano. Um, and, 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 and doesn't exist any longer. And, and it takes years and years later in order to excavate and find. But the, the fact, again, the fact that it was destroyed like this permits us today to find and to explore this uh, civilization uh, that existed. So, so what we are saying, what you are saying, Olga, about uh, digital is, is, is true about any other type of, uh, of object in, in this sense. And of course, we need to develop uh, tools and means in order to preserve it and in order to uh, uh, then explore it and, and you are absolutely right it becomes the heritage of tomorrow and and uh, our friends at the um, uh, Bibliothèque Nationale de France or at the National Institute of Audiovisual are preserving our, our, and, and, and actually already uh, conserving uh, digital uh, media and, and creations. Thank you for, for this answer. Marta, maybe you want to talk about, uh, about the National School of Photography. I mean, how, how do you uh, tackle this digital issue and, and the durability of the, this, this digital support? Well, um, thank you. Uh, during the, this period of, um, of confination, uh, we have experienced uh, with, with the teachers and, and the students, uh, a kind of um, uh, a work together with, with uh, many tools that um, we were not used to, to use because all, the, uh, all the, um, the teaching is at the school, is in, 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 in place. So I can say that it has been a nice experience, but also is making uh, a kind of digital break from some of the students and all, and also teachers that are have they don't have their equipment that they don't have the knowledge to connect with that they are not uh, familiar and also there were of course some uh, psychological uh, issues of being alone because this is also very important to point out uh, we are in our and uh, the school has a lot of students coming from abroad, not only from France, but also for many, many other countries. And suddenly those students, they were confined in, a, in a small places alone. So this is also something to, to take uh, into account. Um, uh, I think that uh, we cannot avoid digital. So today, even we are working with digital with images, images are, today digital, even if we have uh, some dark rooms with, with uh, analogic photography from, you know, all systems of, of, uh, of printing, which is very nice, but uh, mainly young people, young generations are working with uh, iPhones and, and with digital images. The thing is that also digital, like, like real, um, it's a place for also social discrimination. And this is something that I think that as a school we have to work with and we have to try to, to, to see how we are going to, to work next year. For instance, next year, uh, all the schools, not only our schools like our, our, but all schools are going to work with a kind of hybrid model with, between uh, uh, digital and, 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 uh, and real. And it's true that um, this social discrimination is very strong in, in many, many places, in many, many countries. But, um, you know, some of our students are not, uh, they, don't, are, they are not coming from rich families. So we have to provide, um, <clears throat> to provide computers. We have to provide uh, all the elements that they, the connection. And uh, this is something that we are with the French uh, Ministry of Culture uh, working with because um, 
uh, if you have to provide hun a hundred of uh, hundred um, MacBook Airs, uh, it's very expensive. We don't have the, the budget, but we this is our mission. Our mission is to connect with with our students with with the people. Uh, concerning um, exhibitions, digital exhibitions, um, you know, this is something that has already uh, been in place in many, many museums since a long time ago. So this is something that, uh, of course, uh, is existing and it's very good. And I, I really congratulate uh, uh, the, the, the fact that this exhibition has been possible through digital uh, visit, but of course we have to think that uh, the, the the experiences of our body in front of the works of art is very important, and this is something that digital uh, moment like 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 the one that we are living now uh, has to take into account that our bodies are not built to be digital. Our bodies are built to have uh, to share, to have contact, not contactless contact. Uh, to be uh, to be together uh, and also to uh, appropriate the space to our our visit in, in the case of museums um, and it's true that uh, as um, as a, a very interesting uh, philosopher that I um, it's a friend of mine uh, Paul Preciado said um, it is a pity but our body is trying to adapt, because we are always adapting, adapt our gestures uh, into the digital. And this is something that I think um, we have to take into account. Uh, I don't know if you have the same experience that I have, but uh, in our, um, those last weeks, uh, people, uh, is, they are behaving like if something, nothing has happened, you know? So no distances, uh, not a uh, mask, uh, everything, everybody is in the restaurants or in the street and uh, on many, many openings. Uh, by the way, we have one in 30 minutes uh, with the students. So uh, I think that this, this, uh, th those bodies, they need this. Huh? So digital has to adapt to us, to our bodies and not the, uh, the opposite. This is my, my, my uh, statement. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting and, and definitely something to, to reflect upon. And, and I would like to ask a question to, to Laurence. Uh, as, a, as a business, uh, from, from a business perspective, how does uh, Orange tackle the, the digital gap, uh, you know, in searching for new public and for new audiences uh, for, for its uh, content? Uh, so I sorry I don't understand what exactly what you you want I I mean I mean uh, um, how are you tackling from from a business perspective yes. the fact that uh, you are touching younger people but older people maybe who also deserve or want or are interested don't have the, okay. the capacity yeah okay so. okay so uh, it shows that uh, you know Orange we we need to provide and we provide you know the network first. To have access to 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 networks, it's very it's key for that. And also, uh, um, we have a lot of programs also to help. So it's more um, um, foundation uh, to help uh, you know uh, young people or people coming from the diversity or not rich people to to use you know, uh, digital and to know how to use and also senior people. And um, I think that uh, I couldn't tell you to, today, but I think that now we are going to think about maybe new services we have to provide. Uh, and uh, because of the result of, uh, you know, the lockdown and uh, we, we, saw that we saw that digital is key and uh, we need to to help people to 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 use uh, new new services, and maybe you know I think that we are for it's my 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 point on view, but I think that we need to go more on education, you know, to do to do to to uh, today on more on B two C. It's more 
entertainment, you know, it's gaming, music, books, and, um, and video and film, uh, but uh, maybe on education, um, we, we have, uh, you know, a field we need to, um, to develop and maybe to work uh, with uh, innovative services and also with institutions. I think that today we have to be, uh, you know, more uh, uh, transversal too and uh, to provide this kind of uh, services. I think uh, I I'm, uh, think that I'm very confident that we are going to, to open. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to, to ask the question to Mustafa and uh, how, how it, uh, does Luma reflect uh, on, the, on the durability of its uh, digital services? Is it something that you are uh, taking uh, into account or is it a new challenge you are facing? Uh, to, to us, I mean, there are two ways, uh, basically. Uh, digital to us is, is, is a tool, obviously, to, to reach out, as, as uh, Roy said, said it. Um, uh, you have to take into account in, you know, when you are based in R um, and that you do things, you know, with a certain, uh, let's say, uh, ambition. Um, digital is one way to bring it to the many, uh, beyond just like the physical presence of, you know, people being around and close by and who can travel and come and see you. Being in Arles, we have the experience that people can travel up to a certain extent, you know, at least in France, they come and see you once a year. And then after that, maybe you can, you're going to have to spend more money to try and bring just a small fraction of, this, of these people um, and so on. So you have to think differently. And that's how digital is actually one way to expand your audience and, and, uh, and basically diversify the way you do things. Um, we have taken that into account. Uh, uh, I, for example, uh, at the Parc des Ateliers and Luma, uh, we consider ourselves as producers. You know, we produce content. And that's our job. And that's our expertise. And we produce it in one certain form and, and we present it in, in a space. Um, but that content has never been, and let's say, is going to be more and more, as, as Rory said it and, and showed it actually through uh, Pompeii. Um, uh, uh, when you produce a show, you have produced that content. And if you show it in a physical space, then you depend on the capacities of that space and on the people to move around. And, uh, and that's just, uh, you know, you have made that expense, you have made that major effort to do it, and then you're not using it, you know, and just using it in one form. Um, and, and you are limited, you know, in a way. So digital is one way actually to expand the audience and have the world, you know, access it uh, somehow. Um, the, the, the other way uh, we approach and see uh, uh, digital, when we started uh, actually, you know, when we started working on the project, everybody was talking about smart cities. You had the impression that, you know, all the cities are going to be super smart and, you know, and, and we're going to do less and less and, you know, everything will be a lot easier and so on. And just like now, it just like doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, it's just like uh, the word doesn't almost doesn't exist. Um, and we understood, you know, uh, that innovation doesn't necessarily go through digital and through technology. Uh, it just goes, you know, through some very practical low tech things. And uh, innovation goes through low tech as well. I think, you know, and, and that's where creativity comes into account and it is essential. Um, and that's the learning that we have had, uh, uh, basically. So it's a combination of both and technology is an accelerator, is a facilitator, um, but is not the essence. And finally, the other aspect that we touch on technology is through the artists. Artists come and use technologies in ways that we don't expect, and you know, and and it's amazing what they you know what they can come up with. Uh, um, uh, I mean, I have someone in mind who is in residence right now in Al, and you know, who comes who comes from the game world, and this guy is going to change the way we approach, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, so many things. Uh, the technology also we, is going to. Uh, we have we are working on another project um, uh, called the library is on fire and it's well you know the the, the artist and thinker who is working on that with a, 
uh, Charles Arsène Henry and Dominique Gonzalez Foster are kind of reinventing what uh, uh, um, uh, a library could be. Um, so we are, it's pushing the limits and, and basically we rely on artists to, you know, to open the way. So basically these are the ways we try to approach it. Thank you very much for, for this uh, answer. It is a very interesting point of view. Uh, we have one question from YouTube and then we can uh, pass to the next intervention. Our, the question from YouTube is from um, a project leader uh, from uh, Greece and it's for Roy. Uh, the question is, um, uh, are there some apps that are better received uh, with the user experience in museums because uh, apparently in, in Greek museums that implemented uh, applications with um, uh, augmented reality, user, uh, it was very um, few people that were um, using the apps. And so has this question been uh, um, you know, in your mind? Yes, yes, of course. It's open the question about the use of specific apps on, you know, on smartphone and, and what we observe the last time that the user used less specific apps. However, uh, we continue to produce them in order to uh, uh, create special relations with those who download the apps. Uh, However, and this is what we are trying, is to offer the experience on the most uh, open, uh, the most uh, accessible, and the most shared platforms. For example, the AR experience that we launched uh, for the um, uh, Pompeii exhibition, and this is a real innovation. It's innovation about the technology, but it's also innovation of users few seasons ago when we started to use the AR we provided through specific apps first it was specific apps that use AR then it was specific apps that was integrated in our own apps and now for the Pompeii for the first time we are using AR uh, directly from the uh, uh, web browser of the of the of the smartphone so you don't need to have any apps in order to have this experience of course you need to have uh, last generation OS in order to, to use it. So these are um, evolution in, 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 in users in how visitors using their devices and how we as an, a cultural institution uh, evolve in, in our proposition to, to, in order to, to be the most relevant. Thank you very much for this uh, answer and thank you all the speakers for, uh, for this very interesting uh, exchange and, and the round table. Um, we found out interesting stuff. We, you uh, managed to uh, open our appetite to discover the places that you were uh, talking about and also your activities. Thank you very much and I think it is an interesting it's an interesting. I think it's a it's an important um, uh, thing to have the point of view of the European Commission uh, because we we managed to have uh, Matthias Hoffman back, uh, and it's it's going to be a, a very uh, good conclusion of uh, our today's event uh, to have the point of view of the Commission on how to support the cultural sector. Um, um, Mathieu is a policy officer at the uh, Directorate General for Education and Culture and he is responsible for managing initiatives related to the role of culture in cities and regions and to access the culture via digital means. So I think uh, uh, he will have um, important um, aspects to highlight from your discussions in the, in the round table and from the point of view of the European Commission. Thank you very much, Olga. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, I'm very happy to speak as the last person because, in a way, I can. It allows me to to draw, I would say, on what you have been saying, you know, all all, all this time, as well as uh, the initial introductory presentations from uh, uh, from Camille and and Aurelie that kind of gave us a bit of a framework for for our discussion. And and in this sense, I'll be happy to to, to take this a bit forward. Um, 
I have prepared some slides for you. So let's see if I can manage to share my screen with you. Um, what I'm going to, let's see if I can, uh, to talk with you about, since we were given a bit of a general introduction on uh, how culture is positioned in the European Union policies and European Union competences in general, I will speak about this very briefly, and I will concentrate slightly more on, on the topic of funding, giving some examples of uh, European uh, projects related to culture innovation. Of course, I will speak about the, the current situation with COVID-19, and I will try to uh, hopefully end with more of a positive note, uh, looking at the future and thinking about the future European budgets and some of the way forward. So this is more or less the outline of, of what I'd like to, to talk with you about. Uh, first of all, in relation to policies, it was already discussed uh, today at length, so, so I'm, I'm just going to, to, to point it out as well. Uh, the way in which European Union approaches culture is also very very multi-dimensional. Multi we look at culture through different angles. Of course, on the one hand, um, there are programs, and I will get to it later, that, that, that look specifically at the intrinsic value of culture and culture creation. But at the same time, uh, European Union very much recognizes the role of culture for, um, for different, different other policies. So, so really the, the, the question of how culture contributes to the, the economic growth, but also how culture can contribute to uh, social cohesion and social inclusion, as well as how culture, for instance, can be used as a tool of, uh, um, of for international relations, for fostering the relations between European Union and its partners. And here you have the example. I'm going to share the slides uh, with you later. So I think we can find a way to make them available on the, um, on the website for all of you to see and be able to access these links. But this is the example of uh, the, the key European document that uh, defines uh, European Union cultural cooperation, the new European agenda for culture from 2018, that exactly looks at culture from these three, three aspects. So the social aspect, economic aspect, and the, 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 the diplomatic aspect. And if you look at this document, you will find quite a few examples of different projects and European actions that, uh, that fall into these, uh, these different categories. Uh, the same if you look at documents uh, adopted by European Union culture ministers. Aurelie was mentioning that one of the European institutions, important institutions, is the Council of the European Union, where uh, ministers from member states meet regularly and, uh, and decide. Uh, this is the document, so-called Work Plan for Culture, uh, also from 2018, that spans from the period starting from, from last year to 2022. And again, if you look at this document and different, uh, different topics that are actually being addressed by member states and the European Commission together, you find that there is a link uh, of culture and uh, other different topics, including, for instance, gender equality in culture and creative sectors, looking very broadly also at the topic of uh, ecosystem supporting artists and very specifically uh, the topic of working conditions of artists and cultural professionals. Uh, there is also some mentions of the of the topics that, that, that you were mentioning before, uh, namely the, the, the question of um, how to address digital audiences when uh, when trying to, to 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 also organize uh, culture online and this is of course uh, all of these different activities that are foreseen under this document work plan for culture 2019 2022 you can also access the document later and find out for yourselves all of these activities unavoidably will have uh, will have to be influenced by by covid-19 situation and and all of them of course will have a slightly different meaning and and, and possibly outcomes uh, in this European cultural cooperation. Again, looking, for instance, at the topic of working conditions of artists or, 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 or digital matters, as we were discussing today, this is something that has a very different meaning nowadays than it had some months before. Um, Aurelie was mentioning the European Year of Cultural Heritage. This is also quite a, an interesting example of how European Union approaches culture in this broad sense. So again, um, the idea behind the year in 2018 of having this European year devoted to, to broadly understood cultural heritage, because it included both tangible and intangible cultural heritage. It included uh, analog and digital cultural heritage. Uh, it included man-made and natural heritage. The idea was to, to look at how we can celebrate cultural heritage as an asset 
that we inherit from the past, but as an asset that we can use to also build better, more cohesive and more um, economically viable futures. And, and, and uh, on the one hand, of course, the year was just a celebration of uh, European cultures, but it was also a year of strategic and political reflection on different, uh, different topics. So this is, this is in a way also a good uh, example of how European Union approaches uh, culture from these different angles. Um, now moving to the topic of funding. Um, if you look at the funding landscape related to culture and innovation in the EU, uh, there's in fact only one program that is specifically designed for uh, culture and creative sectors. We like to use the term culture and creative sectors because this includes uh, both market and non-market oriented activities. So this is uh, on the one hand, of course, uh, Mm, what we also refer to as culture and creative industries, uh, ranging from, um, from design to, to video games, but this is also cultural heritage institutions, uh, libraries, museums, and many other organizations. So in the current perspective, the program has a budget of uh, roughly 1.5 billion euros. The current budget's from 2014 to 2020. Um, this might seem quite a lot uh, looking at these numbers, but at the same time, looking at the whole European perspective, it's very little actually, and this is just a fraction of a European Union budget. Um, at the same time, good news is that there is also, there are opportunities for culture in other programs, but uh, I'll mention this in a second. Uh, in relation to Creative Europe program, you can uh, access the, um, the database of projects that are financed uh, online and, and have a look for yourself what's being financed and what kind of projects actually are supported by the European Union. So I very much encourage you to, to do so. Uh, here is an interesting example I wanted to, to give you, so-called European Creative Hubs Network. This was a project that uh, was co-financed by Creative Europe program from 2016 to 2018. And the idea behind this project was to try and, uh, and put together, connect and network different uh, culture and creative hubs, fab labs and different uh, cultural cooperation structures that exist uh, all across Europe to allow them to, to learn from each other, to, to have this peer learning uh, opportunity. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to mention this project here because um, um, it is often the case, and it was also mentioned, mentioned today, how to make sure that projects are sustainable beyond the funding period. And, and, and this was actually the case of a project uh, that after 2018, after the end of funding, uh, decided to get established as a, um, as a self-standing network. So this is also a very interesting case. And I also very much encourage you to, uh, to discover this um, European Creative Hubs network that continues and was actually in the first place started by a Creative Europe pro project. Uh, of course, the funding for culture is also available through, um, through other uh, European Union sources. So probably the first and most important source of funding to mention here is the European Regional Development Fund. Um, and here is an interesting example of Dutch Game Garden. This is um, a video games uh, hub uh, located in the, um, in the city of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, and it is also a very interesting example of how uh, European Union funding and European Union money can help. And uh, by pooling these different resources together, in this specific case, uh, for establishing and for um, promoting further um, this, this, this game hub, uh, not only European Union uh, and public money was used coming from the national and local governments, but also private funding that was used. So this is a very interesting example, I would say, um, of how the European development money can also be used for, for financing culture. But of course, uh, there are many, many different examples. Uh, and here I wanted to also mention the, um, the Interreg uh, program because we are also meeting here uh, in connection to an interesting Interreg project um, on culture. Um, there is quite a big number of different uh, Interreg projects. So this is the, there are the projects uh, that, that link together different regions across Europe that want to, to cooperate. And culture is in fact um, the second most popular topic for, um, for these collaborations in the current financial perspective. This is a link you have here is an um, ebook publication that was made in 2018 on the occasion of European Year of Cultural Heritage to promote actually different projects and showcase different projects from Interreg that exist that work on the topic of cultures. So I also very much encourage you to, to have a look at, uh, to see what's being financed by specifically Interreg uh, programs in Europe. 
but of course there is more and 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 then again you can find um, cultural projects uh, broadly understood cultural projects supported through different european programs from uh, erasmus plus to horizon 2020 research and innovation uh, projects uh, from cosme which is a program supporting small and medium enterprises uh, from european social fund you can find a lot of different examples and um, and different projects um, that benefit from um, from EU support. It all depends on the specific angle that these projects might might be adapting. So, uh, in some cases, these projects might support local and regional development. In other cases, these projects might be very important for resurgent innovation. In some cases, these projects might have the uh, entrepreneurship and SMEs angle. But uh, but it's all very interesting, I would say, to to also discover and keep this in mind that uh, that there are these different opportunities. Um, now going to the topic of COVID-19, which, like I said, uh, made us, of course, rethink in many ways, and we are still, I think, rethinking these different ways in which we work. Um, it was also, and it is, um, a very, very difficult um, circumstance for culture and creative sectors. Um, to give you some examples here, what uh, what the European Union was trying to do. Um, on the one hand, of course, first of all, we looked very much at the, um, the Creative Europe program. So this program that I mentioned that is very specifically devoted to culture and creative sectors to make sure that this program can be as flexible as possible uh, for the current beneficiaries of the program, for the future beneficiaries. So for instance, one of the, um, the solutions we had was to speed up the evaluation of uh, upcoming cooperation projects under Creative Europe to make sure that the money that will be distributed through the projects uh, can reach the sectors as fast as possible. And then, of course, we looked at different other opportunities, uh, also trying to reinforce links and um, and and, and uh, be active on social media, for instance, by Creative Europe at Home campaign, um, again, to make um, best use of this uh, Creative Europe program. Uh, at the same time, what's very important, and you might have been also following this um, closely, European Union made available different um, other solutions, uh, more, I would say, horizontal in nature for tackling the COVID-19 situation. And uh, these are, of course, the solutions that are not specifically for culture and creative sectors, but can be very important for culture and creative sectors. So uh, you might have heard about Coronavirus Response Investment Initiative, uh, where the idea was to to allow member states and regions to um, uh, allocate the unused structural funds to, um, to, 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 to tackle the effects of the pandemic. And uh, this money is, of course, at the discretion of member states. It's up to member states to decide where they want to invest this money. But we already receive uh, quite positive signals coming from, uh, from member states that quite a few of them want to, to also invest this, this, this money in culture. Um, the same also for other different tools that were mobilized for protecting uh, uh, SMEs and jobs. Again, these are very general horizontal tools, but, but, but it's also very important for cultural sectors to know about them and to uh, where this is, of course, the decision of member states and regions to, to also advocate that culture can benefit from, uh, from these different tools. Uh, what's very important is also the, um, the networking and uh, knowing about these different solutions, but also knowing about different uh, possible innovative uh, uh, answers to the COVID-19 situation. And this is uh, what we have been doing on the one hand, working closely with, uh, with culture ministries, uh, but also a very specific uh, online platform that we have launched a um, few months ago, Creatives Unite. Uh, I also very much encourage you to, um, to go and see it. The idea here was to, to give a voice to uh, culture and creative sectors across the European Union, to share their different solutions that they have, to share different ideas about projects, uh, also for local and regional and national authorities to, to share information about different calls and opportunities that may have, um, and to create a bit of, a, I would say, a platform for, for exchange for, for cultural sectors in this difficult time. So if you haven't seen this platform, I very much encourage you to go and see it. Um, you can also see a recording of an um, online meeting that took place um, last week with our commissioner, Maria Gabriel, in charge of uh, education, culture, but also research and innovation, meeting with some of the culture sector representatives, as well as the members of the European Parliament, 
to discuss the way forward um, for cultural sectors uh, in the time of COVID-19. So you can find the reg registered um, video from the conference on the on the website and and, and listen to it. Um, so now looking at the future. Um, Aureli was already mentioning that we are at this period now of um, negotiating the future budget of the European Union. And it's, of course, going to be very important and interesting to, to have a look at different programs that exist. So on the one hand, of course, the Creative Europe um, program um, that will start hopefully from, from next year with the, the Commission proposal has a slightly increased budget compared with the current perspective, uh, around 8%. But this is still, of course, open for negotiations. And, um, and the ball is also now, I would say, on the side of Member States and the European Parliament to, uh, to discuss these figures further. Um, and uh, of course, the idea is also to make sure that all these other different programs are available for culture. So not only Creative Europe, but also the future structural funds, um, future digital Europe program, which is going to, to also address the topic of digital transformation broadly with um, hopefully more than 8 billion euros. Uh, again, with the hope that, uh, that this money can also benefit uh, culture and creative sectors. And here, last but not least, uh, Horizon Europe program, so the future research and innovation program of the European Union, which will have one of the specific clusters uh, for culture and culture and creative sectors, for culture and social inclusion, for culture and social cohesion. So it's also very important, I think, for um, culture sectors in Europe to, to also think about this uh, program in a way in which uh, this could be possibly um, something that will benefit them. So, so, so again, of course, this requires a different types of collaborations oriented towards um, scientific and research activities. But I'm sure that there is a very important place in there for, 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 for cultural sectors to also play its role and benefit from, from this opportunity. Um, you also have some some links in my presentation for um, for, for budgets um, that I mentioned for the new proposals of budgets, um, as well as a website that we're updating regularly on different uh, European Union measures that um, currently exist in order to help culture and creative sectors in this difficult time. So I also, of course, encourage you very much to, uh, to see these links for yourself. Uh, and as my final message, again, I, I would like to very much encourage you to stay in touch with what's happening in, in Brussels and what's happening in the European Union. One of the good ways of doing it is uh, by following Creative Europe program on social media, on Twitter and on Facebook. Um, and the colleagues in charge of, uh, of the social media accounts are doing everything, not only to share information about specific calls and opportunities from Creative Europe, but also from all these different uh, programs that I mentioned. So, so this is, I would say, um, a very good first um, occasion to, to also discover what's happening and what's, uh, what's in store in, um, in the EU for, for culture and creative sectors. So this is the last message from me. Thank you very much. And if there are any specific questions, I'm also happy to, to address them. Thank you very much, Matthias, for, for your intervention. I think um, the, the fact that you mentioned the possibility, the example of the, the Dutch uh, project in gaming where they had public financing, private financing, uh, European co-funding. So it is also um, um, impressive um, uh, structure, economical um, uh, model of, of a project which could be also useful for, for our guests here who are of course representative of big institutions, but they can also uh, reflect on uh, um, on partnerships between uh, different um, different uh, institutions, bodies, and and financing opportunities to support the artists that they are already accompanying uh, daily. Um, thank you all very much for the captivating inputs for your time. Thank you also um, for the people that um, watched the event live and shared and engaged with us. Um, I think what we can um, remember uh, and retain from from this uh, from today's European Congress is the the transversality, as as Mustafa said, um, and the, the new forms uh, of of the knowledge um, that artists are trying to create with their supporters. Um, what we 
I, what I would like everybody to, to, to keep in mind is the fact that uh, the, the crisis is not only uh, the time to reflect upon ourselves and upon the, our way of life, but also um, uh, it's, it can be a way to uh, think of the future and the, the wide range of possibilities that are awaiting for us and maybe to try to dream a little bit, to try to dare to dream uh, differently and to, to imagine new projects, innovative projects that go beyond our, uh, our sphere of, uh, of influence and maybe to try to create new partnerships, uh, new collaborations that, uh, that uh, will uh, constitute, as I said uh, previously, tomorrow's legacy and tomorrow's heritage uh, that today is uh, innovative. So thank you very much uh, for participating and uh, I wish you all a very nice evening and uh, good luck with your uh, projects and also uh, we can't wait to see um, the different uh, projects that you, you talked about and exhibitions and what awaits uh, uh, your different institutions next. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.